to ensure that research and expertise provided by, by our presenters as well as our PhD candidates can be shared outside of this workshop. Additionally, it is important to note that the doctoral candidates that will be presenting today are in the process of finalizing their thesis, and as such, we ask you to be respectful and mindful of the content shared. Taking that the workshop will be held fully online, it is not unlikely that speakers or presenters, due to technical or other reasons, may find difficulty to join and present. We will need to be flexibly responsive to, the, to fill these gaps should and when they arise. To now have a look at the agenda, the Brief agenda has been posted on the chat for everyone to see. Um, I will now provide you an overview of the full agenda for today. As previously stated, today's session will be split into two distinct parts. Firstly, we will have the lecture session. For today's presentation, we have a panel session hosted by uh, three dear colleagues of mine who are experts in their field and who provided great insight every year at any of our conferences. And so we welcome them back um, from the different corners of the globe that each of them are situated. And we thank them for taking the time to be here today. Um, especially a huge thank you goes to Matteo, who is joining us at the early hours of the morning from the United States. To provide a brief overview of the presentations that will be presented, they focus predominantly on today's topic, which is sustainable trade. From here, we will have a presentation by four doctoral candidates. The, unlike other days, today's doctoral candidate presentation will also form the, the premise of a panel discussion um, between some PhD students affiliated with the Research Center for Climate Law. So without further ado, I would now like to hand over to our speakers for today, who will be first presenting on their research and then providing a discussion after. The first presenter for today is Assistant Professor Alessandro Monti, who is an Assistant Professor at the Faculty of Law and Policy Fellow for the Crown Princess Mary Center, at the University of Copenhagen in Denmark. He will be presenting on the role of trade and investment law for climate change. Over to you, Alessandro. Thank you very much, Larissa. And uh, I will just take a second to share my screen. Okay, you should now be able to see uh, my slides. Yes, great. So once again, uh, thank you. And uh, thank you for inviting me to this uh, second edition of the uh, Climate Law Annual PhD Workshop in Graz. It is really a honor and a pleasure to be here today and uh, to join you virtually from sunny Copenhagen. Um, it is particularly uh, I'm particularly happy to be um, virtually in Graz, in Austria, the country where I actually finished my PhD a few years ago. So it's always nice to have some connection with uh, Austria and uh, with your group in uh, Graz. Um, as you um, already mentioned, I'm going to talk about the role of trade and investment law for climate change in uh, my presentation. So I will briefly uh, provide an outline of uh, the contents. So I will first start by um, providing some general considerations on the integration of climate change in trade and investment agreements, showing some of the latest trends and developments. Then I will uh, uh, more specifically focus on some normative techniques that can be adopted to expand policy space for climate goals in trade and investment agreements. And lastly, we'll also look at some provisions that uh, specifically aim to promote trade and investment in climate friendly sectors. Also, as a preliminary note, I would like to mention that research conducted as part of the um, this presentation uh, was carried out within the project ENACT, Enhancing Climate Action Through International Law, which has been a two-year project here at the University of Copenhagen, 
uh, funded by the Independent Research Fund Denmark. And the project is now coming to its conclusion. And we also had a, a final conference last March. You can see a picture here of this um, uh, international conference that we hosted and in which um, many scholars from all over the world had the opportunity to present their research on uh, investment law, but also human rights and the role they play for the green transition. But now coming to the uh, beginning of uh, my actual presentation, I will start by providing some context on climate change in uh, bilateral investment treaties and in free trade agreements. And I will start by saying that if we just look at the international climate change regime, uh, one thing that uh, emerges, and that those of you who are familiar with the UNFCCC and the Paris Agreement system are aware of, is that there is a focus mostly on uh, the objectives, the goals, rather than the means to be, um, to be used to uh, achieve those goals. So there is a clear temperature goal now in the Paris Agreement, uh, but there is still much openness as to how that um, temperature reduction goal uh, should be achieved. And this is also accompanied by the fact that international climate agreements are characterized by a system of rather non-adversarial implementation and there is a lack of uh, legally binding dispute settlement mechanisms. All of this instead uh, is very much present in the system of international uh, investment agreements, both uh, BITs, so bilateral investment treaties, and FTAs, free trade agreements, which uh, are characterized by a stronger enforceability and uh, um, they have the potential to direct global flows of capitals towards the green transition. At the same time, though, they have largely developed separately from climate agreements, which determines also some uh, issues in terms of interaction and consistency between these different areas of international law. So what I would like to talk about today is whether or not the interaction between investment agreements, trade agreements and climate change goals can be somehow fruitful uh, to support actually the achievement of climate goals to positively impact climate policies and how these regimes can cooperate. And in this regard, I would also like to mention that the same Paris Agreement under Article 2.1c also uh, recalls a goal to direct global uh, finance flows towards uh, uh, climate change mitigation and adaptation. So there is already also in the Paris Agreement a commitment, a provision calling for uh, a better alignment between uh, the economic sectors and the climate change action. But if we just look at investment law as a framework for climate action, uh, we realize that uh, the promotion of investments per se is rather the focus of the regime and not so much the promotion of low carbon or carbon intensive investments. So the regime is quite neutral uh, as to which investments to promote and protect. And uh, the standards of protection that are um, consolidated in uh, many international investment agreements, such as fair and equitable treatment, national treatment, or protection against expropriation, they are um, equally applicable to uh, low carbon investments and carbon intensive investments. And uh, this can ultimately um, lead to some frictions with uh, climate change, um, goals uh, with the objectives of mitigating climate change in particular because ultimately investment agreements tend to uh, protect the status quo and uh, um, to limit perhaps the right to regulate of uh, host states. This uh, um, as I mentioned also comes together with a dispute settlement that is much more binding and enforceable uh, through ISDS, so investor state dispute settlement in investment agreements rather than in climate change agreements. So ultimately, uh, the climate investment interface is rather problematic. It is so because um, the adoption of climate policies generally is likely to entail a disruption of existing regulatory frameworks because 
climate action is a new phenomenon. It's something that now must be pursued with increasing intensity. It is an urgent need, but it's something that requires also adopting new policies and perhaps uh, changing some of the policy choices that were made in the past. And uh, we can see a very clear example with the coal phase out in the Netherlands, where the Dutch government decided that it was necessary to uh, phase out coal mines in order to reduce emissions, but at the same time, investors such as Uniper and RWE quickly um, announced that they would resort to ISDS against the state of the Netherlands. Now, these claims have now been solved uh, outside of ISDS courts, but nevertheless, the fact remains that there is a serious risk that climate policies such as a coal phase out or similar can actually lead to claims by investors. And um, this has also been raised as an issue by the IPCC, actually, in a report last year, showing that, um, especially in the energy sector, there is a high level of investor protection that can be risky for climate action. Against this rather daunting background, we can see that in um, more recent uh, international investment agreements, there is now an, an increasing number of environmental provisions. And uh, uh, while um, the environment is now more largely covered, specific climate provisions are still rare. And therefore, there is a need to look into how expanding the policy space to promote trade and investments in climate-friendly sectors and reduce those in sectors that are not consistent with climate goals. Uh, we can see more in detail how uh, environmental provisions have been rather booming in international investment agreements following the early 2000s. Now it's quite common practice to include them in international investment agreements, but nevertheless, we should not forget that many treaties, as we can see in this graph, have been adopted before these investment provisions became a uh, climate and environment provisions became more common. So we still have a considerable number of international investment agreements that are currently in force and that have been adopted previous to um, the adoption and the introduction of environmental um, provisions. So we still have many treaties that do not consider the environment in, uh, in force. The tide perhaps is changing with new generation agreements and we will uh, see uh, how this may be the case. But before doing that, uh, I would also like to just provide a quick uh, picture of what we talk about when we talk about bilateral investment treaties, as we now have approximately 2,600 such treaties that are in force. And we have one specialized multilateral treaty on energy, the Energy Charter Treaty, which is also a very significant treaty in practice because of the amount of disputes that have been raised under this treaty and their significance for climate change. Uh, overall, we can count over 1,104 uh, investor state disputes since 1987, whereby the energy sector is one of the most widely represented in these disputes. And uh, especially it's possible to distinguish between environmental cases, cases dealing with fossil fuel policies and cases on renewable energy. But I won't delve further into this because I know that Matteo will have his presentation very much focused on ISDS and climate change. So I will instead rather remain at the level of the agreements and look into provisions and what they can do to support climate action. So after providing this picture on BITs, uh, I'd also like to have a look with you at FTAs, so Free Trade Agreements for Climate Change. And uh, this is actually a very important development in recent years, because we now have uh, around 350 FTAs that are currently in force, and we can uh, see a significant increase of these FTAs since the 1990s, uh, mostly driven by developers countries, but increasingly also developing countries are uh, concluding South-South uh, FTAs. And the reason for this boom of FTAs is partly due to the crisis of uh, the multilateral WTO system. As many of you may know, 
uh, it is currently quite challenging to reach agreements multilaterally and also the and dispute settlements so the panel and the appellate body of the WTO, which for a long time have been considered the jewel of the crown, are now rather suffering. Uh, but um, on the contrary, FTAs, which can be bilateral or regional agreements, offer more flexibility for legal innovation. They allow for parties to design uh, provisions in a way that suits their needs without needing to uh, accommodate uh, a much larger amount of stakeholders and this also means that there can be more easily a greater focus on climate change than under the WTO agreements. But again also in FTAs we have many more provisions that are simply related to the environment than provisions that more specifically uh, deal with climate change. Although they are uh, certainly increasing, there is still a gap also with regard to FTAs. So after providing this overview, the next question is how exactly can uh, BITs and FTAs actually do something to uh, support the achievement of climate goals? So in which way, which type of provisions can be incorporated in uh, FTAs and BITs that make it more possible to actually pursue climate action. And this is what I would like to discuss with you in the next few minutes. So starting from uh, uh, the introduction of references to climate commitments, which is one of the most uh, basic ways in which uh, both BITs and FTAs can actually um, add a link, add some kind of uh, uh, connection to international climate obligations. And we can see that uh, this type of uh, recognitions of, for example, the UNFCCC objectives are included in uh, several uh, BITs. One example is the Belgian Luxembourg uh, model BIT of 2019. Uh, but in some cases, also there is a language on the reaffirmation of rights and obligations under climate agreements. Uh, in uh, reformed uh, or new uh, BITs. Uh, we can see that, for example, in the proposed Article 19 of the modernized ECD, which, as you may know, is the outcome of this modernization process, which has been ongoing, not yet finalized, uh, but uh, reached in an agreement in principle last year, where uh, under the new Article 19, each contracting party now reaffirms its respective rights and obligations under uh, multilateral environmental and labor agreements, including, and there is a specific mention of the UNFCCC and the Paris Agreement. The other example is model BITs, such as the 2016 Azerbaijan model BIT, which also uh, affirms that the promotion and protection of investments should be carried out consistently with the versions of the SDGs and the combating of climate change. So clearly uh, there is an increase in provisions that recall uh, climate commitments. And uh, um, even further are somehow agreements that not only recall climate commitments, but also uh, take into account post-establishment obligations. So what happens after the mm, agreement is in place and an investment is carried out. And we see here a quite innovative language in the 2019 Morocco model BIT under Article 24, which uh, provides that uh, the investors are expected to manage or operate their investments uh, also in consistency with climate change mitigation and adaptation objectives. Then uh, some other agreements also take into account the implementation of the Paris Agreement. And we see here a number of FTAs, uh, including the recent uh, EU-UK FTA, or rather uh, TCA, so Trade and Cooperation Agreement, which under Article 401 on Trade and Climate Change provides that each party commits to effectively implementing the UNFCCC and the Paris Agreement. So here, the focus is not only on uh, uh, recognizing the commitments, but also in ensuring that parties effectively implement, so have an operational dimension on the 
uh, obligations under the uh, UNFCCC and the Paris Agreement. And interestingly, interestingly, also an agreement like the EU-China CHI, which is a, uh, an agreement on investment that uh, the parties have been negotiating in the past few years. Uh, also in that case, there is a provision which would call for the effective implementation of the UNFCCC and the Paris Agreement, including the commitments with regard to the nationally determined contributions. So this is quite innovative. It is not yet in force, but it will be a new trend, especially in investment agreements, which uh, have been traditionally mm, more uh, slower than uh, free trade agreements in uh, having such language. Another way in which um, uh, policy space for climate action can be expanded is actually intervening on the specific standards of protection that are um, present in international investment agreements. And we see here that, for example, uh, taking into account the fair and equitable treatment standard, FET, which is one of the uh, key standards that is largely invoked by investors, uh, a number of newer treaties have actually been taking steps towards um, somehow reducing the otherwise broad scope of this standard and um, including a more specific list of measures that constitute the breach of the FET standard as to limit the, um, the amount of, uh, uh, of options for investors to invoke that standard. And some treaties, have, for example, the, um, the CETA, so the Comprehensive Economic and Trade Agreement between uh, the European Union and Canada have even uh, been mentioning in, um, in an interpretative decision by the parties, which has been drafted last December, that the tribunal should take due consideration of the commitments of the parties under the Paris Agreement and their respective climate neutrality objectives. So in other words, uh, not only there is a trend towards reducing the scope of the FET standard, but even in some more ambitious, perhaps, treaties, uh, there is a growing uh, recognition of the impact on uh, climate change and uh, the affirmation that uh, climate neutrality objectives should be kept in mind also by tribunals that apply that standard. Uh, regarding the right to regulate, this is also something quite uh, significant as a recent development, which kind of goes in the opposite direction as the fair and equitable treatment standard in the sense that uh, it is rather a defensive provision for the host state to invoke uh, its sovereign right to uh, adopt policies. And uh, both, uh, for example, the Dutch model DIT as well as the ECT modernization are good examples of how um, this right to regulate is expanding in newer treaties and um, specific mentions of the environment in the case of the Dutch model DIT, but also more specifically climate change mitigation and adaptation in the ECT modernization, make it clear that states should be able to adopt environmental and climate policies uh, without uh, necessarily risking uh, legal claims by uh, investors. Then uh, coming to uh, another third category of uh, provisions, they are those that serve to promote trade and investment in climate friendly sectors. And in this regard, uh, it is interesting to note how some of the latest agreements are kind of uh, dismantling that uh, taboo of investment treaties and trade agreements as something that must be neutral towards which types of investments to promote and protect. Instead, we can see an increasing trend towards uh, already in the agreement, selecting which investments are more worthy of protection and which investments should be encouraged. And we see that 
with specific regard to sustainable development and climate change. For instance, again, in the uh, EU-China Comprehensive Agreement on Investment, CHI, which calls for investments favoring the green growth and also um, to the fact that investments, sh uh, the parties should promote and facilitate investment advance for climate change mitigation and adaptation. Similarly, also the modernized ECT in a new article on climate change and the clean energy transition uh, calls for um, each contracting party to promote and facilitate trade and investment of relevance for climate change mitigation and adaptation. And the same also we can find in, a, in the Pan-African Investment Code, among others. So this is um at the general level then more specifically we can also find provisions that take into account specific sectors and aim at for example removing barriers to green energy investments and this is the case in the eu singapore and eu vietnam fta's among others where there are provisions calling for the reduction of non-tariff barriers to trade and investment in renewable energy generation. Then other provisions that are quite sectorally specific and therefore also uh, rather clear are obligations to cooperate on carbon pricing, which we can find in the agreement between the EU and the UK, uh, where it's affirmed that each party shall have in place an effective system of carbon pricing. And uh, another way to do this is to uh, reduce tariffs on environmental goods. And uh, we can see as an example, the UK, New Zealand FTA under article 22.7, which uh, has an, a list of environmental goods then uh, specified under an annex, calling for a number of um, goods uh, that are instrumental to activities such as renewable energy generation, energy storage technologies, clean transport, carbon capture and storage, biodiversity conservation, and so on, which are uh, treated uh, in a preferential way with the elimination of custom duties and other barriers. Then another aspect here is also that of phasing out brown investments. So not only uh, promoting green investments, but also ensuring the progressive phase out of investments that are carbon intensive and are not sustainable from a climate perspective. And we can see this, for instance, in the modernized ECT, again, where uh, the compromise that was reached uh, by the parties negotiating the modernization of the agreement was a voluntary carve out for fossil fuel investments, so that uh, there is a possibility for contracting parties to carve out protection for fossil fuel related investments. This is actually an option that both the EU and the UK uh, opted in for, and uh, uh, the timeline for its entry into force is, of course, related to also the final adoption of the modernized treaty, but there was an idea to stop the protection to uh, all new investments and also to existing investments after 10 years from the entry into force of the modernized treaty. This is rather an exception, this type of care bouts, which unfortunately are still not mainstream and rather rare in the landscape of international investment agreements. Uh, and the scholars uh, already for a few years have been proposing models to have a mandatory distinction between sustainable and unsustainable investments. Uh, but this remains at a rather theoretical level at the moment, even though uh, responses to the OECD public consultation of investment treaties and climate change, which was uh, carried out last year in 2022, showed that there is an increasing um, also desire by the scholarly community, but also other stakeholders to um, reform investment treaties in this direction. So I can see that my time is almost running out. So I will just briefly conclude uh, with three uh, key takeaways from uh, this uh, overview on the role of trade and investment law for climate change. The first point is that overall climate provisions are still largely absent or at 
if present, quite soft in international investment agreements. It is true that they're increasingly present in recent agreements, and I showed some examples, and there are certainly many more of how uh, provisions on climate change have been introduced in recent treaties. Uh, but nevertheless, we should not forget that many treaties are rather old and they have not been reformed or updated, and therefore uh, they do not take into account climate change at all. The second point is that if we look at FTAs, uh, especially new generation FTAs, they are overall more ambitious than BITs in terms of climate action. They can have more specific provisions, such as the ones on uh, uh, non-tariff barriers for renewable energy or carbon pricing, which ultimately can uh, uh, facilitate an expansion of policy space and the promotion of green investments, perhaps a bit more of BITs, even though we should not forget the BITs uh, also uh, foresee ISDS as a way to resolve disputes, which is rather uh, rather binding and therefore quite significant in uh, practice. And then, um, as a final point, I believe that strengthening the consistency of international investment agreements with climate change goals is crucial not only to ensure the achievement of the Paris Agreement goals, which is, of course, the first aim of doing this, but at the same time, it will also boost the legitimacy of BITs and FTAs. So it will serve the uh, purpose of uh, strengthening also the way international investment agreements are perceived by the general public. And uh, we have seen uh, with treaties like CETA that there has been quite a significant backlash uh, by uh, by several uh, countries and uh, NGOs and uh, uh, interest groups, and the same with ACT and with several other treaties. So it was not only an option, but I would argue rather a necessity for uh, BITs and FTAs to uh, be mindful of climate commitments and take them into account in uh, uh, reform efforts. And on this note, I conclude my presentation and thank you so much for bearing with me these 20 minutes and give the word back to Larissa. Thanks so much, Alessandro. And thank you for providing quite a, an in-depth analysis of what exactly the role of investment law is in regards to climate change and also vice versa regarding more specifically BITs and FTAs. I think that was really insightful. And um, I think that shared with us a rather expansive array of knowledge. Um, I now move on to our next presenter today, which, which is um, Assistant Professor Matteo Familia. Um, he is an Assistant Professor of International and European Environmental Law at Hasselt University in Belgium. Matteo is joining us from Wyoming at the moment. Um, so, yep. what yeah, hour of the morning? <laughs> uh, well, I don't really want to disclose. You can check it out on the map yourself. Uh, but I just want to say that it's a great pleasure to be here uh, to see that Clean Law strikes again with this workshop. Uh, so, I wish to thank you, Larissa, and all the Clean Law team uh, for the marvelous work in organizing this workshop. And I think my situation speaks for the compelling uh, setup that this workshop has managed to create over time. Uh, so it literally kicks you out of the bed. So um, I hope you can hear me and see me well. I will try to put my, sh my slide and full screen here. So my aim today would be to share some two cents with you uh, to sort of complement what Alessandro said before about uh, the current framework for um, international investment treaties is related to climate protection, just looking at the, let's say, um, enforcement or uh, policing uh, arm of this system, which is basically investor state dispute settlement. Um, as you know, probably investor state dispute settlement is rather peculiar uh, adjudicatory body insofar as uh, foreign private investors are allowed uh, on the basis of the previous consent granted by uh, host states or sovereign states to sue actually sovereign states in case of a certain violations of uh, the standard of treatment included in the international investment treaty. So both bilateral and multilateral investment treaties. Um, as you see in this slide, which does not only represent the one and only Aztec University campus, uh, I also try to 
uh, uh, refurbish my title for the presentation to really give the size of uh, uh, of my take here, which is really to track down uh, a sort of collision course that is happening uh, between the uptake of more stringent uh, climate action domestically by host states and uh, let's say the standards of treatment that are again for this applied and upheld by investors at dispute settlement uh, tribunals um, as they are unfolding. Uh, my, my major take I think here would be that uh, to be uh, very uh, let's say pragmatic and perhaps even brutal is that despite the efforts that Alexander has tried to uh, underline uh, in terms of policy making, in terms of treaty making, to better realign the two systems, uh, um, unfortunately ISDS uh, practice will show a rather, let's say, different uh, trend as related to certain specific situations. I will try to zoom in on some cases to give you the size of uh, uh, of this trend. So, uh, looking at the agenda, uh, I will try to be on time. Um, I will just really much focus on the big picture issue. So, I will probably say something that Alessandro has already mentioned in the beginning about why ISDS and domestic policies are on a collision course. Uh, following up, I will then zoom in on some research work that I have been conducting together with uh, Joanna Setter, uh, Katie Tayan at the LSE uh, Grant and Research Institute, and Corey Steven Marathi at the Sabin Center for Climate Change at Columbia University, where we basically try to categorize investor technical settlement claims as anti-regulatory climate change mitigation. Uh, and I would moreover come up with uh, a couple of zoom ins on two specific cases that hopefully will give you the flavor um, of what is what, what are the tenets per se of um, of this conflict and how in practice ISDS could play out as anti regulatory climate mitigation. Hopefully, I will just uh, share with you a couple of uh, thoughts on, let's say, uh, the way forward and what we can actually take away from uh, the current trend that is emerging or it is already there. It's actually we have found out. So um, let me take you through this journey first, uh, given the size of the matter at hand. Um, this is a very interesting paper. I do recommend, I think every climate lawyer in every, uh, in every room, virtual or physical, to check it out because it really gives you a, a snapshot of, uh, um, a concrete snapshot of the conflict between the investment regime and the climate change regime. This is a paper by Kyle Tienara and others published on science last year. There's another one actually published on um, climate policy uh, a little bit later. Uh, so you can, check out, uh, you can check out some numbers here. And uh, I would just point to two numbers here, uh, looking at this, uh, at this figure. Uh, on the uh, top side of this slide, you see that essentially around 10% of the total oil and gas production volume worldwide is protected by investment treaties. And this is looking only at current oil and gas assets. So not looking at the prospective future potential oil and gas assets. You have heard probably of the major concession being granted by the Biden administration in Alaska recently. We have to give you an example of what the prospective um, future results would look like. <clears throat> so we are talking about a major amount of uh, investments that are actually secured by investment treaties. Uh, looking, translating these, these numbers into uh, money, so trying to monetize this, um, well, uh, TNR and others come up with a sort of account of, in terms of billions of what the concrete actual um, that the size of the matter will be. And as you can see on the bottom side of the slide, around, well, we're looking at uh, basically dozens of billions of dollars that are currently at net present value. Uh, of oil and gas infrastructure being protected by uh, investor state uh, dispute settlement treaties. So um, this is the snapshot of the size of the of size of the issue. Uh, you can also see that, of course, this uh, has some geopolitical and geographic geographic implications. You see uh, the heat map over there. So you see that a lot of these investments are also located, of course, in developing countries which have in place uh, bilateral or multilateral investment treaties vis-a-vis -vis, uh, uh, developed countries or between developing countries. So uh, if I move forward and I just give you another breakdown also from the Thai and other paper, 
you can also put let's say uh, some names out there in terms of what are the usual suspects when it comes to when it comes to investment treat. And you can see that well, the Enara uh, and others basically make the point that of course the energy charter treaty being the largest uh, investment treaty dealing with energy investment is of course the let's say uh, the most the most let's say uh, potentially involved when it comes to both current and future oil and gas projects. So in a world uh, where according to IPCC, we would like to strand assets, meaning basically leaving oil and gas infrastructures in the ground, looking at also what the National Energy Agency said that basically under its net zero scenario, which would be consistent with the Paris Agreement, no farther, no farther, I underline, um, oil and gas infrastructures or oil and gas reserves should be developed as of yesterday, not today. Um, this sort of sets the tone for uh, the potential conflict that might arise, not only under the ECT, but also under uh, bilateral investment treaties. If you look at uh, the bottom left of this slide, you can see that essentially the Energy Charter Treaty alone would account for a range between 10 to $35 billion of net present value of assets protected. So you can see the monetary and economic case for investors to rely on investment treaties. Um, as Alessandro said, there is also of course, the flip side of this, meaning that, uh, of course, as we need to secure investment for uh, to achieve the price agreement objective, some stability, some predictability under investment treaties is needed. Uh, however, uh, of course, as far as the exploitation of future reserves and the protection of current reserves against domestic climate policies is concerned, this is a, a, a figure that requires, uh, how to say, some sort of uh, flexibility when it comes to applying certain standards in building investment treaties. So the question is, how do ISDS tribunals, which again are tribunals that are created under investment treaties, that are completely detached from domestic courts in the whole state, and this is exactly the reason why they have been created in the first place, um, how do they relate to this material issue of ensuring consistency between actions brought uh, or measures brought by domestic countries, sovereign states to achieve uh, their supranational objectives, for example, the EU objectives or the UNFCCC objectives and the protection of investment. Well, the picture is not looking good and this would recognize also internationally. I quoted IPCC AR6 here, which uh, also puts some, uh, some names out there, uh, specifically refers to um, the Energy Charter Treaty and the ISDS under uh, the Energy Charter Treaty as a threat or as a, let's say, uh, holding factor towards the achievement of climate change objectives. Uh, there is a very interesting initiative being pursued by the OECD. We had this discussion actually in January in, uh, um, oh, sorry, in February in Copenhagen for the ENAC housing conference, which was very enlightening um, about the reform of investment treaties. Uh, however, and beyond what uh, is the potential output for a reform or refurbishment or overhaul of investment treaties to look like, ISDS will still be in the picture. And ISDS would eventually, uh, especially under certain, let's say, stances towards um, toward the policy space of uh, definitely undermine uh, climate action. Uh, and I will try to explain why and how in concrete terms. Um, so the dynamic that actually uh, lies underneath uh, the concept of ISDS as anti-regulatory litigation is uh, explained this slide, and this basically can be summarized in two words, which are a regulatory chill. This is uh, again uh, so nothing new uh, under the sun. Uh, it has been proven not only under ISDS, by the way, but basically uh, it can summarize. It can be summarized by uh, this dynamic here, whereby you have domestic measures being adopted by member states, by sorry, all states, which can be, uh, for example, tax device on hydrocarbons, um, bans on oil, oil and gas exploration, <clears throat> uh, or rollback of any uh, financial support to uh, energy infrastructures or energy investment, which would result eventually in ISDS or, interestingly, a threat thereof. So the mere threat of ISDS, of course, which will lead to compensation, um, can as well trigger the regulatory chain dynamic, whereas uh, whereby I'm sorry, you have, of course, some backtracking, caving, basically, of domestic space, uh, or even prospectively 
uh, let's say, a frustration of further action in light impact of the potential uh, unfolding of IVF cases. Uh, of course, this, this plays out against every standard of treatment, including with IVF, in, um, sorry, investment treaties, so expropriation, uh, friend equitable treatment, and uh, most every nation, national treatments of medical discrimination clauses. Um, so again, in this respect, as long as private investors, so companies, essentially, that are operating in oil and gas sector, they can operate also in other energy sectors, but they can also operate in other greenhouse gas intensive sectors, would trigger litigation to basically secure the investments and lock in the investment over a certain period of time, lock in certain rate of remuneration over a certain period of time. I, I believe, I mean, we believe that this would perfectly play out, perfectly fit in the general context of the definition of anti-regulatory climate change litigation as Peter Dozovsky have already uh, developed over time since quite some years now. Um, so how to place ISDF in the context of climate change litigation? Well, Mark and Rule come up with a very general definition, um, looking at all cases that basically relate to climate change mitigation and adaptation. However, and this is an interesting point, ISDF cases do not deal with climate change mitigation and adaptation as a material issue. So the general rationale behind the certain hostage measures that is challenged by foreign investors 99% of the time is not assessed under the premises of its, uh, let's say, environmental or climate uh, justifications or underlying rationale. Um, this is, happens for, for some reasons, perhaps we can discuss it in the Q&A or panel discussion, but for the purpose of this presentation, we just focus then on the taxonomy we have elaborated, which draws departure, departure from this assumption to focus on two criteria. First, um, to material, to, to material criteria, one is a, a more objective one, one is a more subjective one, which looks at the very features of the ISDS system. So first we look at the investment that is protected, which can be uh, an M&A, uh, a greenfield investment, uh, direct investment in energy infrastructures, or any GLG emitting sector, or simply an acquisition of a GLG emitting company, so for example, a coal uh, or oil and gas company operating a certain territory. This is the first criteria. The second criteria is the kind of domestic measure that is being challenged. And again, you have an objective element. So you look at investment, which kind of infrastructure we're looking at. Is it a oil platform? Is it a, a, a coal mine? Uh, is it a renewable energy asset? Or we look at the subjective element, which basically is more broadly focusing on the uh, specific concept, which is the concept of legitimate expectations of the investors, foreign investors, again, a certain rate of profitability of the investment which is basically being frustrated by domestic me uh, measures. Based on this framework, we came up with a, basically a two-fold category. Uh, one is a stranded asset uh, category, which I will delve into in the next slide. And then the second one would be the amendment to climate legislation category, which again, I will, deep down, I will zoom in uh, in a minute. There is a third one, which is actually interesting. Perhaps we can talk about this uh, in the discussion, which relates to hot state counterclaims. So the ISDS system allows under certain conditions to, for host states to sort of uh, strike back against investors to play, to either require for diminished, uh, diminished compensation or even ask for liability of investors under certain conditions. This has been recognized by investment tribunals in certain environmental matters, uh, but I will just leave it as that and perhaps we can discuss it later. So as to the first category, stranded asset claim, um, this basically is a broad category that looks at all the sort of national measures that will result in stranded assets, so result in keeping assets to the ground. So this can be basically pointed to bans on order for hydrocarbon exploration, moratoria, any kind of measures or general application that eventually uh, frustrate uh, invest the investment in a GAG emitting sectors either to altogether or partially. So these examples in this case are the UV per WE cases in the Netherlands, uh, where uh, two investors challenged the coal, the coal fire generation ban in the Netherlands, which interestingly resulted, of course, as an offspring of the Agenda decision in 2015 and all afterwards. Uh, another case is West Moldova versus Canada, where foreign investors challenged uh, the repeal of, uh, or well, challenged actually the introduction of the coal generation ban in Canada. But you can basically relate to all sorts of environmental permitting, so environmental impact assessment proceedings strategic environmental assessment, uh, and we can, think of, we can be even more creative uh, and, and, and look at all sorts of administrative procedures that relate to the very existence 
uh, of a certain investment, uh, for example, in the oil and gas uh, sector. So we have examples there, Ecuador versus Colombia, which made the headline, DC Energy versus US, which is at a uh, technical pipeline case, which was quite a headache throughout the Biden and before that the Trump administration, Obama administration in the US, and Rock Copper versus Italy, which is the case I'm going to mean now. Rock Copper versus Italy is the last, one of the last uh, and most compelling ISDS judgment, uh, I think, that actually made the news and uh, were welcomed with quite some shock in the legal community. Uh, not only because of the high amount of compensation, around uh, 200 million euros that were awarded by a UK-based company, but for the very reasoning behind the decision. So I will try to be very concise here. Uh, I summed up the facts of the case, which are very important when it comes to ISDS litigation, which are, again, context-specific and case-specific. So what happened in Rocopa versus Italy is this UK-based company that basically acquires interest in the field in Umbrina Mare. You can see that in the, in the map over there. Uh, very nice place, actually, down the Adriatic coast uh, in 2014. Um, uh, well, the exploration permit for that field was already granted to, to other companies in 2005. However, uh, an environmental impact assessment related to the future production concession after successful exploration was granted in 2015 by the Italian authorities. Well, at the very same time, also due to local opposition to the project and which actually sparked uh, the opposition to um, offshore exploration altogether in the country, <clears throat> law, a law was passed, so a measure of general application which basically banned oil production within 12 nautical miles offshore Itali uh, Italian um, coast. As a result of that, and again, as a result of a piece of legislation that enacts a total ban on hydrocarbon explorations and production, the production concession that would basically kick off the project was denied in 2016. This, in light of a rock copper, of course, would amount to a violation of the Energy Charter Treaty. And the tribunals actually unanimously, so all three arbitrators, found that that dynamic here, so the final decision to deny the production concession, would amount, praise for it, to an expropriation of the property right of rock copper PLC to get granted a production concession. Think about that. So the tribunals actually said, by having been granted an exploration permit, by having been granted uh, an environmental impact assessment related to the investment to the future oil field exploration uh, production, rock copper accounts for a property right in the production concession, which was of course frustrated by the Italian government or by the Italian authorities, and therefore this would amount to a violation of expropriation standards. And as a result of that, the tribunal basically went on to account for damages, just looking at a future buffer scenario where the production concession would be granted, and therefore the oil field of Brina Mare would be fully exploited, coming up with a one nine, uh, 190 million euros damages. Second category here, amendments to climate legislation and policy. This is again a very broad category because basically looked at all sorts of uh, measures that somehow roll back or change regulatory schemes that are originally pursued to achieve climate action and uh, therefore impinge on uh, certain heavily regulated sectors, which can be the energy sector, but it can be as well other sectors. Um, the obvious example here uh, is um, the rollback or retroactive changes that have been introduced to the entire schemes for renewable energy uh, generation in Italy, Spain, Czech Republic, uh, Romania, and Ukraine as well. We have more than 60 cases against these countries because exactly of this. So uh, <clears throat> basically investors challenging the fact that by rollbacking a uh, feeding tariff scheme, which provides remuneration, as you know, for feeding energy to the grid, renewable energy sources, basically the, um, the government of Spain, Italy, and so on, basically frustrated the expectation of a certain rate of return on a certain renewable energy investment. There are other ancillary cases to the category so, for example, the coke industry, yes, these guys actually challenged the rollbacking of the cap and trade scheme in Ontario. So, the introduction of the ETS scheme and the repealing thereof was actually challenged by coke industries, saying, "Look, by repealing the cap and trade schemes, you are basically frustrating our financial assets into certain renewable or low carbon investment." Um, as a zoom in for this uh, for this category, I will just uh, point to the PV investors versus Spain case. Uh, what happened in this case uh, was that 
26 EU-based companies invested in Solar PV in Spain in 2008. Uh, again, to this end, they relied on the feed-in tariff scheme uh, that was enacted in 2007, uh, that basically provided for fixed premium remuneration for 25 years, based on the amount of kilowatt hours fed into the grid, a certain euro cent for kilowatt hours for 25 years, plus a lower rate of uh, remuneration, but that would stretch out over the, life, uh, the lifespan of, uh, of the investment in renewable energy infrastructure. Well, three years afterwards, three years later, the FIT regime was amended, uh, basically, redu uh, basically just repeating the lifespan remuneration. And in 2013, so other three years thereafter, the fixed premium was repeated altogether. So basically, if you are a solar investor in Spain in 2008, you will get yourself a fixed premium remuneration for 25 years plus a lifespan remuneration. And in 2013, you get basically nothing. So that, of course, sparked uh, a wave of litigation against Spain. And uh, in this case in particular, uh, the tribunals by majority found that this dynamic here, so the amendment to the FIT scheme, Amen, uh, uh, amounted to a violation of fair and equitable treatment standards because, of course, these changes in, in, the, in the regulatory scheme for uh, remuneration of solar investment or investment in renewables would be uh, uh, basically an arbitrary, unfair treatment of the investment of uh, these 26 EU based companies. What is relevant in this case, however, is that the tribunal found that, in fact, Investors, uh, the, the concept of legitimate expectations here, so the true legitimate expectations of investors vis a vis the change in the regulatory scheme was not deemed relevant here. So the tribunal said, look, as a renewable investor, you would expect some changes in the, in the regulatory scheme for feeding tariffs. So in that respect, you, uh, your case is not funded, not grounded. However, the, the tribunal also recognized the fact that some rate of return must be established, must be granted. And in that respect, this, and the tribunal said, look, this is a true rationale of the feed-in tariff regime. So remuneration must be granted nonetheless, and regardless of the actual cost trajectory of renewable investment, which, as you know, is sinking. So uh, this is very telling because in some cases, tribunals have just focused on the legitimate expectation of investors and look what Spain did was basically wrong. They violated the legitimate expectations. That was crazy policy making, basically. In this case, the tribunal went even farther in a way because they over they, they, they sidelined the legitimate expectation point, but they focused on the fact that actually investors would have to get a rate of return. Uh, and that was it. And again, this speaks for the, the material, uh, let's say, assessment uh, of certain domestic policies being brought by, uh, by investment tribunal. So bottom line, we have mapped some cases out there and we have found out approximately 70 cases that amount to our two categories stretching over the last 10 years. Uh, we have summarized them in this, uh, uh, in this chart here. Uh, as you can see, the trend is also uprising. Of course, the 2014-2015 wave is due to the part of the renewable energy litigation. And as you can see, of course, this is somehow in line with the upward trend of ISDS cases that uh, the United Nations um, uh, Convention on Trade and, and Development is uh, tracking down. I do recommend you check at Unstag's website for all the information on ISDS claims. So concluding, because I think I'm quite ahead, quite uh, overshooting. Um, well, ISDS is indeed playing a role as an anti-regulatory climate change litigation in several respects. <clears throat> I've tried to highlight how and why. However, looking at another side of things, um, let's say uh, at the dark side of the bone here, I would just say that, of course, these cases that I mentioned and the, the uh, inherent inconsistency between how ISDS applies to the standards and the same standards of treatment as such and domestic climate action would like to tell us some lessons learned. So, uh, for example, the, the environmental permitting or stranded asset claims, as you want to call it, speak for the need for accountability, transparency, consistency in the decision making process. Uh, because, uh, of course, against the, the view that the tribunals have around certain, uh, let's say, domestic conduct, uh, definitely uh, domestic states must be wary that a conduct that lacks transparency, a conduct that lacks, a conduct that lacks uh, consistency and, uh, let's say, accountability would definitely result in ISDS claims, uh, as well as uh, flexibility in the economic, in the development of economic or financial uh, frameworks for the support to uh, heavily regulate the sectors must be carefully crafted to avoid and prevent ISDS claims. So bottom line, if you want to avoid the collision course, you will want to look for stability, predictability, and consistency domestically. So, uh, uh, well, that's, that's supposed to 
that was supposed to be Austin. Uh, but uh, thank you very much, uh, Dankeschön, for your attention. And of course, I look forward to the questions and the discussion in the panel session afterwards. So I hope I give you a snapshot of the problem here and I pass it on to you very soon. Thank you so much, Mateo. And thank you for um, giving a perfectly a great overview of the ISDS and its challenges, especially in relation to the developments recently with regards to um, these disputes that ha you have mentioned in your presentation and the understanding of climate change litigation. I think this presentation has followed perfectly from the previous presentation, which set the scene on um, investment and the state of investment in climate change, and then moving aptly into the dispute settlement more specifically. I'd now like to hand over to our next presenter of the day who will be closing our presentation sessions. And that is Dr. Rita Simone. She's a scientific researcher at the Institute of State and Law at the Czech Academy of Sciences in the Czech Republic. She will be presenting on sustainable consumption and greenwashing, reflecting on the UCPD. Over to you, Rita. Thank you very much. First, I would like also to thank for the invitation. It's my second time on this great workshop. I think it's very beneficial for all of us, but also for the PhD students. So uh, I would uh, uh, tackle a different aspect, very often underestimated aspect of the climate issue. And I would like to turn from the international level more to the European level, because here I found uh, more regulation than in general. So my topic, I hope my slides are moving, is sustainable production, consumption, and greenwashing. Mm -hmm. I hope it moves. Great. I would like to start with a motto or a toad from Akenyi, who told that a critical mass of informed and ecologically conscious consumers is necessary to apply pressure on producers through market mechanism. So today, I will try to conduct whether and why the shift to a green economy and sustainability happened, how the market reacted on this green transition, what kind of disrupting effects of green washing we can face. And then I would like to turn to the legal frameworks. I will try uh, to uh, answer whether the existing legal framework for work washing is sufficient or not. And I will just mention some regulation which are on the in the pipeline. And I will try to uh, conduct whether it will fill the gaps or not. Why probably I should not tell you because all you are all aware about the climate urgency, but just make a note due to the growing awareness of planetary boundaries and climate change, a significant shift to the green economy was forced, mostly by the European, but also by the European national legislators. Sustainability and green economy as such become an emerging trend, which one hand increased the pressure, on the companies, but also on the stakeholders somehow to tackle the issue. On the international level, we, we can find more or less unbinding a light-handed regulation. So a concept of what you are very well familiar with it was formed in 1987 by the Brundtland Report or Coming Future, which only 20 no oh, more years later, two decades later, were adopted as universal calls by the General Assembly of the United Nations. So this is actually a non-binding legal framework. However, uh, the national uh, governments uh, should achieve sustainable development till 2030. So we do not have too many time for it. Uh, very important uh, international agreements like United Nations Framework Convention, Climate Change, Kyoto Protocol, and Paris Agreement, all uh, referring to sustainable development goals. So it's uh, 
universal core for everyone. On the European level, uh, the Parliament went one step ahead, and in 2002, they integrated the Sustainability Development Goals in the Treaty of the European Commission. It was at that time Article 6 of the TAC, uh, which was later on the removed to the, uh, through the Lisbon Treaty in the Treaty for Functioning the European Union. How you can read in this slide, the Article 11 actually requires all policy activities because it says that environmental protection requirement must be integrated into the definition, but also to the implementation of all union policies and activities. And here is our remark, in particular, with a view to promoting sustainable development. So governments, also on the European, but also on the national level, are uh, connected to these goals and according to this aim several green initiatives were brought on the European level. I will only mention a couple of them, the European Green Deal, the Circular Economy Action Plan, the new consumer agenda, the Sustainable Product Initiative, Sustainable Finance Action Plan, but also uh, the European Climate Law the regulation on establishing the framework. How the market reacted in this transition? It first, it increased the pressure on companies, but they gain also potential benefits in terms of the financial performance and reputational capital. But how is common on the market? The first counter served, getting force, and all markets were overflowed with very vague and misleading environmental claims. Uh, in 2020, an expert, European expert study found that half of the claims are misleading, or an earlier uh, American study, 2009, uh, made by Terror Choice Study Group stated that 95% of the analyzed products committed some of these seven sins of greenwashing, what I will little uh, mention in the next slide. So greenwashing, however, we do not have a clear uh, definition in the existing European law. Greenwashing went to the Oxford Dictionary and the state is this greenwashing is a disinformation disseminated by an organization to present an environmentally responsible public image. What are the main sins? I just covered five of them, but there are several others. For instance, when the refrigerator with the class A advertised as very energy saving. However, we have A plus and A plus plus categories. It's a sin of irrelevance. Product marketed as 100% organic cotton without tests is a sin of no proof. A tire advertised with a label very similar to the European label, which you can find at the third point, is a sin of worship of pairs labels. Oils, you know, like you see at the fourth, Echo Clean oil products are a scene of fibbing. And there are some other, I would like only to mention when a product is marketed using less water than other, although the production procedure is much more energy consuming than a similar products, this is a scene of lesser of two areas or hidden trade off. Interestingly, uh, the most uh, uh, comprehensive uh, uh, database on climate litigation do not uh, mention greenwashing as a special type of uh, litigation. So the greenwashing cases we can find uh, under financing and investment cases or misleading advertising cases or disclosure cases. 
So it shows that uh, the awareness, this is a separate uh, kind of climate change cases which should be tackled in a different way, way is not so known. However, I tried uh, to categorize these claims and concerning to the actors who is causing it to the home, B2C, B2B, or business to states by fake disclosure, or like the FIFA case was an organization to the community, uh, cases can be very different. But the second possible uh, categorization, this stage of product life cycle, the claim affects production, transportation, or maybe waste, recycling, to which type of business activity to claim refers. It can refer to crediting or marketing or reporting, or how the claim was manifested on a text message or a product or name or uh, reporting, uh, the claims are really different and the legal uh, challenges and also uh, the settlement or judgment should be also very different. This is only un to underline that the judicial control on the greenwashing cases will be very complex and complicated. What are the disrupting effects of greenwashing? It first undermines the competitive advantages of firms. They are really uh, produce more environmental friendly. It eliminates the motivation toward the green performance because they uh, cost, which they are investing in the greening of the product production is it cannot reimburse trust. It destroys the trust in ego labels, which is a very costly and lengthy procedure. And nonetheless, it disrupts consumer decision making. Why it is so crucial problem? Because the European uh, consumer policy is mainly and only information driven. So we are not regulating markets. We are only regulating what kind of information the firm should deliver to the consumers. And uh, the information as asymmetry is uh, uh, very huge between what the consumer knows about the product and what uh, the producer or the seller knows. So due to this fact, the effects are really uh, huge. We can also say that comprehensive and environmental accurate information or transfers the climate indicators are indispensable for enabling consumers to make a more sustainable choice. Now I will turn to my last part, actually. Uh, I will try to show you how the legal framework which is, exists can tackle greenwashing. Uh, how to, you, know, you can see on this um, picture, the visualization was not so easy. We find very fragmented and multi-layer framework on tackling greenwashing. They are sometimes sexual specific uh, rules, sometimes horizontal rules, but none of them could deliver a holistic approach. So only to mention a couple because the time is uh, uh, flying. Sector specific regulation for greening production delivers very important uh, information for consumers. For instance, what I already mentioned is energy efficiency uh, categories are created by these uh, rules. Uh, but uh, they are only B2B or B2C actions. So the, the consumer get information that is very hard to enforce if uh, the producer rules, rules take uh, categories or false categories. The horizontal directive on misleading advertisement is a very good functioning uh, uh, 
requirement. However, it uh, delivers only competitors to combat uh, uh, misleading advertisements of other competitors. So it's uh, the state cannot uh, make a per se a claim against the companies. The sustainable disclosure and reporting rules uh, are not ready. The European Commission is uh, debating still, so it will take at least three years still in implementing it in the national laws. So it's not, not enforceable by now. The collaborative directive uh, describes what and how some labels can be marked as a labor so it's very important but uh, uh, it is a b2c uh, regulation that it means that the consumer should claim that the labor is not correct which is probably a very complicated way the most uh, significant uh, legal instrument to combat greenwashing is uh, up to now the UCPD directive, it's a directive on unfair commercial practices. Actually, the Commission since 2002 underlines that uh, uh, en environmental claims also fall in the scope of these directives. This directive, so when a consumer finds some uh, greenwashing claim, or some uh, very vague and vague claim, it could go to the national authority and try to combat or fight against this claim. But the problem is this is a B2C directive, so the consumer should claim, which is happening very rarely in Czech Republic, for instance, we still do not have greenwashing claims in other states, in the Netherlands, in Austria, in Germany, probably also in Denmark, is much more common. So to uh, summarize, the framework does not seem efficient. Uh, the screening of websites for greenwashing in 2021 showed that half of the green claims lack evidences. So we can uh, fully agree, or I fully agree, uh, on the thoughts of uh, Einstein, which, which was made actually in 2012, uh, that we should learn from past mistakes and regulate uh, to prevent greenwashing. There are now initiatives in the pipeline. So the amendment of the UCPD directive is on the plenum of the European Parliament. They want to create a better safety net, net uh, to combat this crane. Uh, parallelly, a new, more holistic green claims directive is planned. However, this will not uh, uh, apply in the existing sector specific directives. So, this is not so holistic like it seems. And there is the third one, the Digital Product Passport Initiative, which would deliver for the consumer very important information of, about the environmental performance of products, but is also only an initiative now. Uh, only a uh, last slide on uh, the new drafts of the Commission. So the Better Safety Net uh, finally would define important uh, issues. Finally, we will get a definition for environmental claims, uh, explicit or generic claims. The certification schemes will also define. And what is actually the most important, this is the last point uh, down for blacklisted actions will be mentioned which are per se prohibited. So the national authorities do not need uh, to prove whether this action can be stopped, economic behavior or consumer or not. All these uh, blacklisted actions should be combated. And uh, if the 
uh, actions of the companies cannot uh, be cannot be named like these four blacklisted actions, then the authorities still will have the competency to measure whether the claim can disrupt economic behavior on the consumers. And in this case, the Article 6 will uh, name to exclusively uh, environmental misleading practices which I uh, put it there, or misleading omission when, for instance, the sustainability compar comparing tools do not require inform provide information about the method and the selected product groups. So to sum up, with this new di directive or with the directive amendments, the seven main things of greenwashing will be covered and three other sins will be also tackled. The, the sin of advertising a common practice or a sin of advising a feature imposed by law or a sin of big comparing tools. But what I should also add, uh, still we will find with interpretation issues and probably not each national uh, authority will uh, gain so much effort to combat the claim so the national authorities can really sanction in a different matter and uh, probably some authorities like the Italian one will combat some claims, although others like the Czech one will not speak or will not issue any investigation in the claims. So this different activity is a problem. And the, the last uh, uh, remark, the UCPD scope is limited to B2C actions. So it will be very compli complicated to enforce the directive. That was my part for this. Uh, Panel, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Rita, for an insightful discussion on greenwashing. I think this is something that we face a lot more regularly than we think we do. And unfortunately, we're not as um, aware of what greenwashing is, what it's defined as, and how this has negative implications on climate change, broadly speaking, and the initiatives made for the environment. Um, before we open to the panel discussion, I would just like to provide a brief overview of the presentations provided. Um, I won't be too long as so that we can have a more engaged panel discussion. While I'm providing this overview, please feel free to post your questions in the chat or to raise your hand and, and turn on your video and unmute yourself and we can ask questions and engage directly with the experts before us. In the first presentation, we were provided with an overview of the role of trade and investment law for climate change. We looked at the differences between BITs and FTAs and the role that these play for climate commitment, both within the international climate regime, but also at regional perspectives. And we also looked at the investment law as a framework for climate action through the promotion of investments, the standards of protection, and the limiting policy space and dispute settlement, uh, the final point being more discussed by our second presenter. The first presentation went further to expand, to, to highlight the need for expanding the policy space for climate goals, making um, clear statements on references for climate commitments, the duties of investments, investors, the implementation of the Paris Agreement, fair and equitable treatment, and the right to regulate. We then moved on to the promoting of trade and investment in climate-friendly um, sectors, Firstly, on the binding commitments to support green investments, the reaffirmation of commitments and encouragement. Ultimately, we ended with an overview of the facilitation of green investments, the sector-specific discussions, um, carbon pricing and tariff reductions on environmental goods. And to conclude, our first presenter provided us um, with three distinct statements, namely that climate provisions are still largely absent in international investment agreements, 
that the new generation of FTAs are in fact more ambitious than BITs, and lastly, that the strengthening of consistency in international investment agreements with climate goals could lead to the achievement of not only the Paris Agreement, but also boost, boost the legitimacy of BITs and FTAs, broadly speaking. In our second presentation, which discussed international, um, which, which uh, apologies, discussed investment state, dispute settlement, and domestic climate action. It looked specifically at mapping the collision course, as um, Matteo put it, when looking at um, investor state dispute settlement. Firstly, we looked at the current state of events, which um, was highlighted by an article. The article has been placed in the chat for everyone to view. Based on this overlook, we looked basically at a global snapshot of the oil and gas considerations and the monetary and economic factors influencing investment decisions. We also had an overview of the IPCC perspectives and the OECD considerations. This is basically to understand the dy dynamic nature of ISDS and the so-called regulatory chill that we found ourselves in. We then went on to defining what exactly is climate-related ISDS and the set of two criteria, namely the kind of investment protected and the kind of measures challenged. We then had a further analysis of three distinct criteria, the standard asset claims, the amendments to climate legisl le legislation and policy, and then um, ultimately looking to zoom out a little bit further um, at the um, conclusions and further takeaways. From this, we had an analysis of two key cases, the um, Rock Hopper versus Italy and the PV Investors versus Spain, which are two cases that give a perfect indication of the state of ISDS and climate litigation and what we can expect in future developments. Our last presenter gave us an overview of the shift to green economy and um, sustainability, but more specifically to look at the reaction to greenwashing, what it is, what it's defined as the greenwashing sins that she highlighted, provide a great overview of what we can expect greenwashing to look like and maybe some key indicators for us to look at in greenwashing ourselves. She went further into the disrupting effects of greenwashing um, and what this existing legal framework for greenwashing entails and whether this framework is sufficient, even though it be fragmented or a multi-layered legal, legal framework. Ultimately, there is hope in a future legal enhancement regarding greenwashing directives and a, a better safety against greenwashing, ultimately looking at possible new definitions or new practices in this regard. So with this rather basic overview of the three presentations, and hopefully we can have an engaging panel discussion. I see that there's already a question in the chat, so I will first address the question in the chat and then we can move on to um, any additional questions. Like I said, please feel free to post your questions in the chat or to switch on your video and your microphone and to engage directly with our presenters. So uh, the first question is from Monica Fergalova, who says, good afternoon, many thanks for the excellent presentations. I have two questions. The first is to Alessandro and to his observation that IIAs must strengthen the consistency with the Paris Agreement to rebuild the legitimacy of the investment regime. What changes, in his view, would have to be made to the modernized ECT on top of the proposed amendments to meet this objective? So we'll do the first question and then I'll move on to the second half of that question. All right. Thank you, Larissa, and thank you, Monica, for this uh, really interesting question which actually gives me the opportunity to expand a bit more on uh, uh, the matter of the ECT modernization, which has been a bit of a roller coaster in the past uh, year, uh, because as I mentioned before, in June 2022, uh, the announcement was made that an agreement in principle uh, has been reached uh, among the contracting parties to the ECT to uh, reform the agreement. The modernization itself, in fact, has been ongoing since 2017. So it's been about five plus years of uh, negotiations, which ultimately led to the adoption of that uh, agreement in principle, which uh, uh, was uh, a collection of uh, uh, statements on how the treaty will be made greener. This was followed a few months later by uh, a new draft text of the reform DCT, which was never officially published, but it was leaked and somehow released 
on uh, on the internet and so it was possible to have a look at uh, the new text more or less of the agreement even though the numbering of the articles for instance was never fully settled and uh, in any case it was not very surprising the content of the agreement because of course it reflected the agreement in principle and it reflected also the proposal by the European Commission for the modernization which had been circulating since 2020. So there were of course some small changes but all in all it was kind of in line with expectations. Uh, what happened afterwards is that uh, uh, originally the agreement was supposed to be adopted in the autumn of 22 but then um, political backlash by uh, several European member states leading also to the announced or to the effective withdrawal of European member states, um, at least um, six, seven, I think even more than that from the agreement. This uh, created kind of a stalemate uh, so that the Energy Charter Conference, which was supposed to take place and uh, decide on the agreement, was then postponed to April of 23. So there was essentially the idea of giving some time for all the parties to talk to each other, to negotiate and to find a mutually agreeable solution. However, what happened next is that in April 23, so last month, uh, once again, there was no agreement to be reached. So that uh, new uh, session to adopt the agreement was once again postponed and uh, to date, uh, there is no other meeting that is specifically scheduled, at least the last time I looked, I think this is still the case, to um, to agree and to vote on the final modernized text of the ECT. So the situation is still uh, a bit up in the air, which, uh, uh, as you said, uh, shows that uh, the legitimacy of the ECT, even after the reform, is still uh, not fully uh, accepted, uh, at least by several stakeholders. Uh, this also led to the European Union uh, institutions having to accept the fact that many member states are not happy with the modernized ECT and therefore also publishing a known paper last month in which several options are proposed, including uh, withdrawal of the EU uh, or withdrawal of some member states and so on. So there are still many options on the table. But coming more to your question, given, given this background, what changes would have to be made to the modernized ECT on top of the proposed amendments to meet the objective? This is um, everybody's guess in the sense that uh, what will actually make it acceptable to all the parties. I honestly don't know. But what I can say from my perspective is that there are at least uh, three elements in the modernized ECT that are still rather weak, which uh, therefore need uh, some further intervention, in my view, and possibly this could appease some of the backlash, at least from some of the member states. The first of such elements is the sunset clause. The sunset clause, which um, provides protection to previous investments for 20 years, even after a party has withdrawn from the treaty. This means that even if a member state decides to withdraw from the treaty, for the next 20 years, investments uh, that have been uh, carried out up until the withdrawal are still protected. And this is very much the case with Italy, for instance, which already withdrew from the treaty in 2016, but nevertheless is still being targeted by claims, including the Rocopra claim that Matteo extensively analyzed. Uh, therefore, Intervening on the sunset clause, either reducing it or removing it entirely, could possibly be a way to uh, better align the ECT with climate commitments, also keeping in mind the urgency and the uh, pressing timeline of climate action. We have now, at least in Europe, a net zero commitment by 2050, and it is really hard to reconcile this and also the Fit for 55 strategy, the European Green Deal broadly, uh, with uh, protecting fossil fuel investments for longer. So the sunset clause is the first element that should be further addressed. The second element is um, ISDS, because the ECT modernization 
uh, intervened more on the standards, on the right to regulate, so on the substantive protection of investments, but it did not really intervene on the procedural aspects and on uh, uh, how to resolve disputes. So uh, somehow either uh, excluding protection, excluding ISDS as a way for dispute settlement or including additional uh, uh, mechanisms such as the required presence of climate experts or the role of uh, amicus curiae brief in uh, ISDS under the ECT, this could all be beneficial to making uh, the ECT even more consistent with climate goals, but instead it was not part of the uh, modernized text. And third and last, I think also the phase out of fossil fuels, uh, the way it was proposed in the modernized ECT, uh, works to some extent because of course it is important to have the possibility for parties to introduce a voluntary care bout for fossil fuel protection and this is also what the European Union and the UK effectively decided to do. However, this is by far not sufficient because firstly the timeline is still quite uh, generous towards investors because even after the uh, adoption of the modernized ECT, uh, there will still be a 10 years uh, of protection. And this is yeah half the time of the sunset clause, but nevertheless, it is quite a long timeline considering again the uh, other timeline, which is the increase in greenhouse gas emissions and the need to uh, mitigate climate change to stay within the temperature goals set in the Paris Agreement. And then the fact that it's a voluntary mechanism, it is also a shortcoming of the modernization process because uh, other parties uh, still haven't uh, opted in for the, for the phase out of fossil fuels. So potentially it could lead to some kind of forum shopping to shifting uh, carbon intensive activities in other jurisdictions that do not have the curve out rather than reducing the protection entirely. So these three points, Sunset Clause, ISDS, and Care about for Fossil Fuel Investments are, in my view, uh, the areas in which the modernization proposal uh, can still improve. Now, will this be enough to make it acceptable by the parties? It's actually a great question, but I think it would at least uh, help. Thank you so much, Alessandro, for that. And, and thank you, Monica, for your question. Um, yeah, Matteo, if you've read the question in the chat, then you can go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thanks, Monica, um, and uh, for a question, because it is actually good to pinpoint some issues that, again, I didn't have time to touch upon, um, which boils down to the inherent feature of ISDS, of course. Uh, UNCITRA is part of the, let's say, game rule of the game changing process that is trying to be pursued uh, uh, in the context of ISDS, in the context of uh, investment treaties altogether. So it's not a marginal part of this picture. Um, I think it's working group three that is uh, in those two that is specifically dealing with uh, ISDS re reform. Well, uh, as Sandro mentioned that five years process of reform of the ECT, I think we should has been working on that pretty much around the same timing. Uh, there are a lot of talks going on, and of course, there are a lot of discussions being put on the table, agenda items being put on the table about refurbishing or overhauling the whole ICS system. Uh, I would say the state of affairs is um, negotiating parties or, like, um, yeah, let's say um, the, the developers uh, and, and real thinkers behind the UC trial reform are agreeing on a certain, to a certain degree, that. ISDS must change, must be informed in terms of increasing accountability and transparency, and I would say uh, more abiding to a rule of law. Uh, I will go as far as that. Uh, if you think about it, the ISDS system does not even provide, in most cases, I would say 95% or even more of the cases for even uh, appellate uh, a judgment or whatever way to challenge material decisions from the merit perspective. So a judgment like Blockhopper would never ever be heard up from other uh, investment tribunals or any other court of law in terms of its merit. Uh, so if you put the whole, I mean, this, this system in perspective, you can see that of course some reform is needed. So what UNCITRAL is 
trying to do is really to come up with a comprehensive account of what legitimate issue with, is with regard to ASDS and trying to come up with a potential solution. Now, what is really much more on the agenda is, of course, uh, uh, the system of multilateral investment court that the EU has been pursuing under CETA, so the Comprehensive Agreement with Canada, and is trying to push as a as a general agenda, um, which would provide for a multi-tier system that's pretty much like a proper court of law uh, with a roster of arbitrators. Uh, again, a two-tier level, so with the possibility of actually appealing uh, first instance uh, awards or judgment. Uh, that would probably provide for more transparency uh, and will definitely bring into take into account also issues like uh, uh, participation of civil society and micro school, which, by the way, are, have been uh, allowed in many instances by the tribunals, whereas they have been rejected also in other instances. Uh, so I think uh, if the question is where do we stand, I would say uh, the process is ongoing. I'm afraid, uh, and this is the same for the, let's say, treaty making process, that the timing of this reforming process is not definitely adding up to the timing that we have as an existential issue in terms of uh, fighting climate change. Uh, so um, we really need to boost up the process also of reforming ISDS. Um, but I think, nonetheless, progress has been done. Uh, all the documents are publicly available um, around the UNCITRAL negotiations process. Uh, but the, there is an understanding that, of course, an increased uh, transparency and legitimacy is needed in the system. Um, so I see there is another I see there is another question for me in the chat, Larissa. Would you like me to, uh, to reply to that back to back? Or? Um, yes, please, Matteo. I think you've answered some elements of that question um, in your answer right now. But if you have any additional comments, that would be great. No, I, I want to point out one, one, uh, one last, um, one last element here because, well, as you know, uh, international tribunals are not bound by precedent, right? There is no such a thing as the jurisprudence constant in, in in international arbitration, uh, and this is a, a recognized and established fact. Um, under under international law, um, and this is definitely the case with ISDS cases. Um, as I said, ISDS cases are inherently case specific. So the elements, the factual and legal uh, background of each ISDS case is very peculiar to that case, and it's very key to understand the final outcome of um, of a certain reasoning uh, by ISDS tribunal. And this was why I tried to sketch out all the facts. One of the most important facts of the case in both uh, in both instances that I have addressed. Um, so, um, answering to the question, I would say uh, I hope that Rock Copper would not set the tone for future litigation related to all uh, bans on oil and gas exploration. Um, however, it is also a fact that the ISDS tribunals tend to refer to each other. Of course, there are ISDS awards that are more more authoritative than others simply because they have addressed some issues in the first place, uh, how to interpret the expropriation standard, how to interpret the FED standard, the concept of legitimate expectations, so they are, of course, looked at, read, read through by other tribunals, and often quoted, uh, quoted, I'm sorry. So, for example, the TV investors versus Spain tribunal, when recognizing this sort of conflict between the rate of, the objective of ensuring rate of return of invest, uh, investors vis-a-vis -vis the uh, whatever other uh, material issue, including, by the way, climate protection, uh, they quoted extensively from another tribunal dealing with a similar case against Spain. Uh, so there is this sort of process of cross fertilization but we cannot really say that the rock copper case would be a binding precedent in that respect. Yet, it certainly speaks for a certain approach of ISDS tribunals towards a more, let's say, let's call it conservative or a commercial oriented uh, view of certain issues, including how to balance uh, investors' rights, vested rights uh, against um, public policy rationales and public policy space. So I hope this answered to your question, but I would be happy to build on that uh, also remotely and bilaterally. Thank you so much for that, Matteo. And, and yeah, I think with you going over this case in more detail, I think it is a little bit of a eye opener to see what the potentials are in different jurisdictions, but to also understand that while this does not legally set precedent anywhere internationally, it does raise a bit of a concern as to what could potentially happen in jurisdictions that adopt the same approach as we have seen in Italy. Um, 
we now have another question from the chat for um, Rita. It says, thank you all for your lectures, Dr. Rita Simone. Does the greenwashing directive have any indication of what measures will be used to identify possible greenwashing culprits? One could imagine the extent of greenwashing may be overwhelming, and as such, identifying all culprits could be challenging. Is there possibly a greenwashing registry or directory? Thank you. Over to you, Rita. Thank you. Thank you for this great question. It's a really important issue. Uh, the answer is yes and no because um, uh, since 2009, the European Commission uh, um, publishes in each five years a recommendation on unfair commercial practices. And already in 2009, there were, not, I would say, best practices announced where actually the, the case law was also uh, involved the uh, description of the case was uh, uh, clarified and this list if you uh, compare it from the recommendation from 2016 or the latest from 2021 the list of the greenwashing cases is constantly growing so greenwashing cases are actually the main part of this uh, recommendation but on the other hand each uh, a, a national administrative authority and national court is free to decide whether uh, the case is a, a green claim or it's a greenwashing claim and how it can disrupt the economical behavior of the consumer. So this is what the courts are um, proving and measuring. So in this sense, they have their sovereignty, they can uh, decide however they wish. So they are not centralized, binded on the recommendation of the European Commission. However, in uh, concerning unfair, com uh, unfair contractual terms, some member states are functioning very similarly like these unfair commercial practices. Some member states uh, created registry for unfair terms in contracts. And this is also possible to create on the national base some register, but uh, due to the fact that the claims are so different and uh, uh, some are uh, manifested by the form, some uh, due to the visualization, and there are many psychological studies that, in fact, uh, the description is clear vague. But if you put there some symbolic green picture in the background, it is five times so disruptive and misleading than only a claim. Um, it would be very hard uh, to make a, a clear register, which is stating that this claim is uh, a greenwashing claim and this is not. So therefore, I would say that it's good that the uh, national authorities uh, cooperate. We have a so-called CPC network in the European Union. The European Union makes uh, some uh, common steps. This was also the sweep in 2021, where at the same time, all health authority is screening some product groups or some online statements, and they are very efficient. They really show the similarities or the differences in the countries. But uh, a, 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 a European register of green or greenwashing claims uh, it can be done by an uh, NGO, probably only. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Rita, for that answer. Um, yeah, I think especially now when we see a lot more companies that are committing themselves to uh, tackling climate change, I think this is something that we need to keep an eye out for, especially within the legal field. Um, I'd now like to hand over to uh, my colleague, Carlotta. Um, if you have any questions or comments that you've also received on your side, um, please feel free to share them. Thank you, 
Vanessa. Um, yeah, I didn't receive any comments from the chat. Um, I will just try to ask some um, questions. They will be a little basic because I must say I don't really, I haven't researched so far in the topic. So I'm very grateful for you for really uh, giving us an overview and going deeper in this very important topic. So um, my first question, and this might sound already very naive uh, to Matteo, is on the possible positive effect actually of these uh, climate claims or ICDS claim on domestic climate action. I mean, I, I do understand that the most likely effect would be that states just stole their climate action as a consequence of these kind of claims. But it seems to me that you were also suggesting that um, we have now, you know, an, an idea of how states could defend themselves. So in the Copper versus Italy case, uh, case, there was a problem of transparency, you know, from the side of the, uh, the Italian government, the environmental permitting process leading to the initiation of, of this uh, project, right? So, I mean, I imagine that a possible, um, uh, a possible a possible way to go or a possible continuation of this story could be that states actually learn how to defend themselves or like clearly regulate um, against this kind of, of projects when they are clearly in contrast with their own climate commitments. Um, so my, my question would be, how do we incentivize actually better climate action uh, especially in a way that is tailored with what these ISDS claims have taught us. Um, and, and then um, also out of, out of ignorance and, and naivety, um, a question about the relationship between the EU climate law, the new EU climate law that is setting binding targets for all the European states and the Energy Charter Treaty. And if you see that the, you know, the, the contrast between these two instruments of law could be dealt by, for example, the European Court of Justice, if you see these as some potential interesting uh, pathway. Um, also a question to, to Alessandro, given that this whole, um, this whole field is in the end very connected to geopolitics and Actually, it seems like we are framing the climate change regulation issue as an economic war, no? uh, which is an important frame that we must take into account. So we, you talked a lot about China, I think, as, a, as an important player in sustainable trade agreements. My question here is, if you think that there might be some new important players emerging in this field that we might look at and thinking particularly of Brazil, at Brazil now, and it's, it's a relationship, it's commercial relationship with China um, or other, other countries in the world where we have seen, again, I'm thinking of Latin, Latin America now, countries in the world where we've seen a, a political shift in the last years towards more uh, left governments. I would say it doesn't mean environmentalist government, but if, yeah, the question is if there would be other players that it, it is uh, interesting to look at uh, from the perspective of a sustainable trade agreement. Should I take on? Please, Matteo. Okay. Yeah, thanks a lot, because uh, by the way, there is no such a thing as a naive question, especially when it comes to this topic. Um, so um, you're right, uh, you're right between the lines. In our paper, which is forthcoming, we actually uh, make the point that yes, ISDS is bad as it stands uh, for the whole regulatory chill, uh, let's say, uh, that spiral. But at the same time, it can teach a lot uh, about domestic policy making. Uh, again, uh, I put some blame on uh, ISDS reasoning in the, in the case that I uh, pointed to your attention. But I would not say that in both cases, Italy and Spain were being laudable either. Um, I mean, for the perspective of a foreign investor, you want to have, again, consistency and stability when you plan your investment up front. 
So you cannot really work in an environment where you have certain remuneration or certain, uh, uh, say, uh, reassurances or representations, and those representations are uh, lifted altogether overnight. Uh, this is, again, uh, again general uh, principles of good faith, uh, uh, speaking legally, but more generally, this is definitely a sense of frustration of property. Uh, so, and this, of course, as you know, would play out differently, whatever the different legal systems, of course. So, I guess uh, these cases are teaching uh, are teaching some lessons as to how to craft uh, support for or certain measures that would be likely to be adopted, and all the more so in light, for example, the EU climate law in Europe, uh, as well as other frameworks in the, in the US, for example, where I'm based now. So the EPA in the US has announced uh, the, 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 the regulation for the clean power plan. So basically by 2035, each and every coal power plant would be either shut down or would have to apply CCS. So you see this overhauling, these changes in policy will be more and more stringent and will require, yes, consistency in how you represent your way forward to, uh, to investors. And I'm afraid that especially in the case of the entire scheme, uh, which again are exemplary in view of further uh, possible process of reform, for example, for fossil fuel subsidies, which are still relevant in the room uh, across the world, I would say. Um, yeah, you want to do it right. Uh, because of course, investors do not charity. Uh, investors would like to see a rate of return. Uh, boards of directors, you know, they answer to shareholders. This is the, the system we have crafted. And I think this, 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 this panel here, would like to address, I think, a more general topic, which is really how to reconcile these two systems, which one, well, it's one, the, the free trade and free investment or protection for investment, uh, as well as the whole system that lies behind uh, regulation of companies related to claim, green claims and stuff like that. Well, these are product, byproducts of a certain neoliberal thinking that we have been pursued over the last 60 years. And now we have realized that, well, uh, this system perhaps might be at odds with other major objectives and existential issues. So we have to find a way, really make sure that everything is in order because we simply have no time. So, um, so I agree with you, there are a lot of lessons to be learned. Uh, however, there must be also some changes in the mindset, in the approach, which can be done already with the legal tools that we have right now in the public international law and under the current international investment regime within the ISDS arena. Thanks for this question. I really appreciate that. Alessandro, over to you. Thank you. So thank you, Carlotta, for your question, which, again, is actually really topical and uh, it um, touches upon one of the key issues of all of this debate, integration of climate change in economic agreements, which is geopolitics, the role of um, major players in the global uh, scene and how can they influence the climate agenda and also how do trade and investment agreements uh, serve also those goals. I think um, this uh, is something really complex because if we look at the European Union, for instance, it is undoubtedly the player that has pushed the most for green uh, uh, trade and investment agreement. So not only the EU has pushed for the Paris Agreement, but then also for making sure that the Paris Agreement is linked to, is referred to, is mentioned in uh, pretty much all the FTAs that the EU has concluded after the adoption of the Paris Agreement. At the same time, the EU is not the only player and also arguably not the main player on the, the global level. And starting from China, China is uh, a really complex case because the EU has started these negotiations for a comprehensive agreement on investment with China that was also before COVID and then uh, unfortunately all that happened afterwards played a role in um, hampering the adoption of the agreement and now it is in a, a dormant uh, phase let's say and it's not clear when that agreement will actually come into existence. And um, <clears throat> another player that uh, uh, perhaps can play a bigger role is the US, which also uh, compared to the EU, the amount of action, especially at the international level of the US has not been uh, that uh, strong on climate change. 
but at least with the Biden administration, they are back inside the Paris Agreement, which is already something. And uh, uh, the USMCA, which was negotiated with Canada and Mexico, is not uh, as progressive as uh, some of the EU FTAs or the UK FTAs, but at the same time, it's also not that tragic from an environmental climate perspective. So it's pretty much in line, even improving slightly the NAFTA that was there before. So um, the US are possibly also becoming greener, but still at a very slow pace. Uh, South American countries, yeah, I think Brazil with the, after the Bolsonaro era can perhaps uh, do better also because I think it's a bit difficult to do worse than uh, the Bolsonaro time for climate change. Uh, we'll uh, we will see there what uh, what time will bring. I think also Australia actually is an interesting case because Australia has been typically quite uh, reluctant to say the least uh, in adopting climate policies, but now it seems to be getting a bit more on board. And if we look, for instance, at the FTA concluded with the UK in 2021, I think uh, there are provisions on climate change pretty much similar to the ones in many FTAs of the EU. So I think also there, there is potential to strengthen climate action. Then there are many other players across Asia, India first, uh, and many others. I'm not talking about Russia because I think at the moment there are other priorities there, unfortunately, but definitely climate change doesn't seem to be anywhere on that list for Russia, not even on top of the list. And that's a very, uh, sad news for the world. Uh, then uh, there is also the question of how China's uh, investments in Africa, especially, are uh, performing in terms of climate change. And I must say, I am not too familiar with the various agreements and uh, deals signed by China as part of the Belt and Road initiatives with many African countries, but I'm sure it would be a really interesting study also to look into uh, the climate change in that part of uh, of the world and how uh, the role of China, the US, Europe and other players are influencing that. So bottom line, yeah, in geopolitics is a key consideration for uh, the expansion of uh, economic relationships, which goes hand in hand also with sustainability and climate change uh, considerations. Thank you to both Matteo and Alessandra for your responses to Carlotta's question. Um, I'd now like to open the floor to Rita. Um, Rita, you had raised your hand. Um, did, I believe you had a question. Yeah, I would have a question both to Alessandra and Matteo. First, uh, thank you for your great presentation. Due to the fact that today's investment will form our future market, investment is therefore really crucial concerning to climate change. So therefore, I was really shocked what you told Alexandro that 20 years after withdrawing the uh, international treaty, the investment investors are still uh, uh, protected. So first, um, my first question, um, it is not disrupting the competition actually between investors because this is a cross-border investment and they are really protected. But uh, if if the same company would be active on the home market, the national regulator very often, we, we are facing it very often, is not delivering anymore the subsidies and changing his mind. So their regulation is possible, but in cross-border, not so much. And my second question, maybe on, on Matteo more, uh, there is a nice old, uh, Roman principle, the clausula uh, rebus extendibus, which allows uh, to withdraw treaties and also contracts when uh, there is a fundamental change in circumstances. And my question is whether courts are really using this more or less civil law principle in the argumentation or whether if you would say some uh, more place for, for applying this uh, instrument or principle, because due to my understanding, 
this uh, principle could be immediately uh, uh, applied or interpreted for all investments because the situation is so much crucial that we should really rethink if we want uh, to make a status quo for these investments. Thank you, Rita. I will start answering your question on the sunset clause. Uh, I think, uh, yeah, I mean, definitely it can create some disparity among investors and uh, that may, may affect competition. So this is possibly another shortcoming of that type of clause. Um, in a way, it's also sort of a first camera privilege because if you have made an investment at the right time when you were still protected, then uh, you are um, in a better position and it's part of the due diligence of investors and of uh, the assessment of uh, risks and benefits when making the investment. So it doesn't create, I think, a, a disparity in the sense that it's foreseeable and it's there for everyone. But of course, if you decide to make an investment after the withdrawal of the treaty, then you know that you won't be protected by had that treaty any longer. And if you made it just in time before the withdrawal, then you were lucky enough and be protected. And I think, uh, I don't know how many of the investors who made investments in Italy, let's say in 2014, 2015, knew that uh, soon afterwards, Italy would withdraw, but they would still be uh, covered. So I'm sure they were very happy to have done the investment at the right time. Um, but in general, I think, such sunset clauses are a bit of a also a, a memory of the past in the sense that they are the sign of a time when things could be a bit slower, when 20 years was considered a time horizon that was still okay, long enough, but not that long. Now, I think with the insights we have, the data from the PCC, the science on climate change about the, the pace of uh, global warming, so we know that 20 years it might be a global warming of three, uh, 3.5 degrees, something that scenarios we don't even want to think about. So 20 years now sounds really way too much. Even five years would be too much. So I think, uh, yeah, competition issues are a side effect of that. And then the harm for climate change of protecting otherwise stranded assets, unsustainable investments, that's... Uh, the really the main uh, challenge with uh, such such a class. Uh, following up on that, um, also uh, to answer to your question, Rita, there, there are a lot of legal weapons that they, that you can use under uh, public international law to address this issue. The one that you mentioned, which is pretty exotic and reminds me, of course, of our good old times when law was solid probably uh, as much as the Roman Empire. Um, it, it can be used, you know, it, you can argue that circumstances have changed uh, and we are facing an existential threat and if we don't do anything quickly, we are off the cliff altogether. But again, uh, these would be, uh, as I see it, and I put it very blindly, they would be naive legal thinking before ISDS tribunals. Um, simply, because of the fact that indeed you want to look probably at another legal tool that you have there, which is basically straightforward to each and every lawyer probably in this room, which would be uh, the principle of systemic interpretation or systemic integration, as you want to call it, under Article 31 3C, Vienna Convention of the Law 101 Public International Law. Something that every lawyer in this room, every, everyone that has taken some international law course will know about which says that basically when you're interpreting a treaty, you don't want to interpret it in isolation, you want to interpret it within the context of the legal ecosystem. And I wonder why and how one cannot really think of the climate law ecosystem as something that would feature, that would play a role in the context of interpreting investment treaties. ISDS tribunals, when they are, um, uh, when, 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 when deciding upon cases, they normally rely on, well, public international law and the text of the treaty itself. Mm -hmm. This is the, 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 but normally these are the boundaries of, of let's say the, the legal grounds for the decision. Why investment tribunals do not really engage with this principle? Why do not really open the door for basically these kind of considerations in light of the Paris Agreement, in light of COP decisions that would say that we had to phase out, possibly phase down, yeah, 
war games here. Um, coal power plants, for example, coal fire generation as soon as possible. This is an open question, and I'm not I'm no one to answer this question. Uh, so yeah, technically you're right. Uh, good luck with bringing this case uh, before an ISDS tribunal. We could work on a micro query on that and we'll see how it turns out. Thank you once again to Rita for that question and, and to Alessandra and Matteo for your remarks. I would now like to open the floor once again to any um, closing comments or any closing questions before we end today's panel session. Um, if you have any questions, once again, please feel free to post it in the chat or to raise your hand and to switch on your video and your microphone and engage directly with our presenters. If there are no further questions for today, um, for our experts, I would like to extend a huge thank you once again to our three presenters for joining us for this session, for taking the time to share your research and your expertise with us. Um, you have definitely brought a new perspective on investment law, on investor state dispute settlement mechanisms, and on final stages of consumption and greenwashing, specifically but by corporations. We always look forward to your engagement at these workshops, and we hope that we will continue to have you at future workshops to share with us and engage with us. These panel discussions are always enlightening and they encourage and spark debate in many of our respective fields. So thank you once again, and we appreciate you taking the time to be with us. I would now like to um, move on to our next stage. Before we move on to the PhD presentations, we will be having a short break um, of 20 minutes. So we will be coming back at 14.35. Um, CET, so that is roughly 19 minutes at this stage. So thank you once again uh, for joining us for the first half of this day. And we hope that you'll be able to join us for the second half of the day, which is the PhD presentations, where we will be discussing some of the presentations from those of us directly involved at the Research Center for Climate Law. So have a great break, grab that cup of coffee, stretch your legs, and we will see you swiftly back after the break.
So um, next, okay. uh, this, this feels really weird to do, but next on the agenda is me. Um, <laughs> so I am a PhD candidate at the University of Graz in the Institute of Public Law and Political Science. I am in the final stretches of my PhD thesis. Um, yes, so I will be providing you with an overview of a section relating to my thesis, so not the entire thesis. Um, if I did that, we would be here for way too long. So I'm going to do the section of my thesis that um, I, I have completed quite a while back. Um, and maybe after that, I'll probably just discuss the ways forward and, and what I'm in doing in the process of finalizing my thesis so that we can kind of get an understanding of the process. Um, if you have any questions in the middle of my presentation, at any point in my presentation, you, you can just stop me and, and ask away. That's perfectly fine. Okay, so we begin um, with the age old question. Um, can everyone see my screen? Yes. Great, thank you. Um, okay, so this is basically my presentation in um, on my doctoral thesis. My thesis is titled um, Switch on the Light, a Comparative Law Study of Energy Access at a National and Supranational Level to provide a little bit of an oversight of what that means. Um, my thesis looks at energy access from the supranational perspective, comparing the European Union and the African Union, and at a national com um, perspective, comparing South Africa and Austria. I chose those specific regions, not only because I am from South Africa, and, and now that I am in Austria, I'm living in Austria, but because um, there are certain, I don't know, overarching themes that you can find within energy access across both of those um case studies, but also there's a lot more similarities and there's quite very distinct differences. So I thought that having um, those regions and those countries as uh, case studies would be a good opportunity to get some varied perspective, but also to try and draw some connections between um, what is usually envisioned as very differing regions and, and countries, broadly speaking. So my research objective looks at um, ways to critically review legislative and policy frameworks that seek to address access to energy at national and supranational levels, thus identifying and analyzing current legislative mechanisms that seek to ensure universal energy access. Through my thesis, I aim to firstly provide insights to policymakers on possible policy instruments that could be beneficial in improving energy access and how these policy instruments should be implemented. Additionally, I aim to identify the probable implications of these instruments on already established frameworks or legal instruments. So as I mentioned yesterday, um, my topic when I first started seemed really extensive. Um, it seemed like there was a lot to research and a lot to study. So um, I did find myself in the trap of too much research, a lot of research um, and, and feeling a little bit overwhelmed to begin with. So um, I did what I described yesterday as, as the Sherlock Holmes effect. So I took my research topic um, and I wrote down each of the individual aspects of my thesis that I wanted to cover and how I plan to cover it and what golden thread I would have throughout my thesis. So before I move on to one of the golden threads, um, I just want to do a, a quick exercise with everyone so that you kind of understand the concept that I'm dealing with. So wherever you are, whatever you're doing, I want you to just take a few seconds and look around at the room around you. I want you to look at the ceiling, the floors, whatever's on your desk, whatever you're using to engage us with. All of those require electricity. And that's the main point of my thesis. So we take for granted more often than not, especially in developed countries, what it means to have energy access. Um, with that being said, energy access as its pure definition is often understood differently from developing countries to developed countries. And those differentiations are not necessarily bad ones, but they just mean that energy access is dealt with differently in two areas of the world. If we want to be so broad as to say the global north and the global south, then we can understand within the global north, for example, energy access is not necessarily the same as energy access concerns within the global south. So the global north, when looking at energy access, has now sought to look more specifically at clean green energy transitions to ensure that 
citizens that already have access to energy have now received access that is clean, green, and sustainable. Whereas in the global south, we are lagging behind in the sense that energy access is the basic meaning of whether we can have access to electricity when we switch the light on. So hence the, the title of my thesis, Switch on the Light. So now to just provide you with some energy access in context. So according to the International Energy Agency World Energy Outlook Report released in October of 2022, for the first time in decades, the number of people around the world without access to electricity is set to rise in 2022. And according to data released earlier this year, that number did in fact rise. It was likely that it would reach 774 million people, which would mean an increase of 20 million people from 2021. And coming after the pandemic related slowdown in both 2020 and 2022, would take the number of those without access to electricity levels um, last seen in 2019. The rise in the number of those without access occurs largely in sub Saharan Africa, which we can see in the um, map in front of you. The lighter yellow areas, so to say, is the areas most um, affected by energy access concerns. And these areas um, have an unprecedented number of households who are unable to access electricity sufficiently to meet basic needs within their household. So that's also something that needs to be considered. But what do I mean when I'm talking about energy? So according to the SDGs, energy access is split into two distinct criteria, access to electricity and access to clean cooking fuels. Um, for my thesis, I'm looking more specifically at electricity. So what do I mean by electricity? Again, I mean thermal energy um, sources and I mean grid energy sources. So thermal energy sources, we're talking about um, coal, more specifically in, in my instances, and photovoltaic e electricity. Um, and when I'm talking about grid energy uh, structures, I'm talking about within the Austrian context, we have mini grids or centralized or decentralized electricity grids, broadly speaking, at a national level. So that's basically what I mean. Now, looking more specifically at the definition of energy access. So this involves a household having reliable and affordable access to both clean cooking facilities, which I previously mentioned is included in SDG 7, and to electricity, which is the focus of my thesis, which is enough to supply a basic bundle of energy service initially, and then an increasing level of electricity over time to reach the regional average. So based on this comment, this was the definition provided by the International Energy Agency in 2020. Um, most academics are now utilizing this definition um, when understanding what en energy access is, which uh, gives the potential for there to be a greater development on the definition of energy access. But it also means that based on this definition, a lot of other academics have written more explicitly. So Shu, for example, said that the the definition provided by the International Energy Agency implies that access to energy should take into consideration fairness of the energy consumption level among individuals and households in a region. Now, this definition does break down into further subcategories of the definition of energy access, which could prove challenging, um, especially in a thesis where you can sometimes get bogged down with the different aspects of the definition. So, for me and for my research specifically, I was looking at um, a household having access, not necessarily reliable or affordable, but basic access within the global south. Um, and then in the global north, that definition slightly shifted to include renewable, uh, or reliable and affordable access, but also included the definition of renewable access. Um, then I didn't really focus very specifically on the other parts of the definition which deal with basic bundle of energy services initially and then an increasing level of electricity over time. Um, I basically looked at the initial access to energy. So the energy either supplied nationally at a, in a decentralized energy market or by uh, electricity suppliers. So for example, in Austria, we would have um, Energie Steiermark, who is a local provider of electricity and being the supplier, what kind of electricity do they supply? So that is the crux of the matter. So the first half of my thesis identifies the problems of energy access within the context of these different regions and the different countries. And the second half of my thesis focuses on possible solutions to address energy access. One such solution that I identified at a regional level is 
just transitions. So we've heard a lot about just transitions, especially this has become a new buzzword in the energy sector. But what exactly does that mean in terms of securing energy access? Now, just transitions is also understood differently in the global north to the global south. So for example, the global north, a just transition is a transition to a carbon neutral society where we no longer rely on fossil fuels for electricity. But just transitions in the global south means utilizing renewable sources to ensure electricity access as a basic need. So we can already see the correlations between the two, but we can also see the different the differences um, between those concepts. So just transitions, according to the World Bank in 2022, uh, a just transition means a transitioning countries away from coal, the world's most dominant and most carbon intensive source of energy, is crucial to ensuring a clean energy future. So we see here the transitioning from coal is a common thread between the global north and the global south. Uh, but in the global south, that transitioning to coal um, is a secondary consideration. And at first is the consideration to ensure that every community within the global south can turn on the light and receive electricity as a community. So just transitions are the idea of a fair and inclusive energy transition that leaves no one behind and considers the communities that will bear the worst impact from decarbonization. So leave no one behind. We've heard this concept within sustainable development and we've heard this concept within reference to climate change, broadly speaking. So the concept of leaving no one behind is the golden thread ultimately, but in the global north, maybe the leaving no one behind out of the trend to renewable energy the global south leaving no one behind to ensure that everyone has electricity as a starting point. Supranationally speaking, we have uh, the comparison between the European Union and the African Union. So to provide more clarity to what that is, within the European Union, we can see the structure of the European Union as a triangle, mainly being that the European Union or considerations passed at the level of the European Union at the supranational body, then filters down into the various member states. The African Union, on the other hand, does not operate as such. The African Union operates within a circle, so to speak, where there is less of an involvement by the supranational body in the day-to-day -day decisions of the member states. Within the Afri European Union, we see just transition being mentioned purely within the clean energy for all Europeans package, which was introduced in 2019, that has had a number of implications on directives and regulations, as well as national legislation and policy, more broadly speaking. Whereas in the African Union, we have the African Energy Transition Program, which is um, brought forward by the African Energy Commission that sits within the African Union, and their goal is to design the African energy transition. So ultimately speaking, the European Union provides insights on how to implement energy access considerations that catered to climate goals while providing universal energy access that was clean. On the other hand, the African Union, um, for the time being, only provides guidance, only mobilizes support, is um, implementing capacity building, monitoring and reporting. Basically, they are there as an oversight body and not necessarily as the body that hands down the directives and regulations of its member states. Like I said, there's the triangle and the circle. So firstly, we can see that the triangle, um, if we're talking about the European Union, um, let's do this. So at the top, we see the European Union as a supranational body has introduced the Clean Energy for All Europeans package. And this comes with a number of directives and regulations that have been implemented. Then national authorities have reviewed this package and determined what these directives and regulations would mean for each of their member states. Within the member states, we then see direct policies, legislations, regulations, programs that quote and that draw from the directives and regulations brought here too. On the other hand, in terms of the African Union, as I previously stated here, is the circle. We see the AU member state being the center of the circle and the considerations of the African Union float around the circle, giving insight, giving guidance, but never directly filtering into the member state itself. So we can see that there is more of an influential perspective from the African Union and its organs, and the member state has complete autonomy in its decision making. So just transition agreements. Um, basically, at 
the COP in COP26, we saw that there was the introduction of just transition agreements between a number of European member states and South Africa. I was particularly interested in this because um, this would then trigger what would be planned as a just transition fund. Um, I did write a publication on this and, and the publication is seen on the left of the screen, specifically related to just energy transitions in progress, the partnership between South Africa and the European Union, where I look into greater detail on what a just transition agreement, if executed correctly, would mean for um, a country such as South Africa and ultimately would provide a, a copy paste mechanism that could be utilized for other African member states. So how the ultimately when addressing just transitions and the energy access, my main question was, how can legislative policies, instruments and structures interchangeably be implemented through and for the betterment of current goals, for example, the Clean Energy for All Europeans package and the African Energy Transition Program and future intersections, the just transition agreement amongst the respective energy sectors. So how can this agreement speak to the different organisms at a supranational level, but also at a national level? Ultimately, legislation and policy design and development is the key that holds these three considerations within the same goal. It, um, legislative interpretation, policy design, and structural interventions are the key in finding a way to translate what the European Union has done, what the African Union has done, and to develop a just transition agreement that builds the bridge between these two. In closing, my thesis, once again, is titled Switch on the Light, a National and Supranational Comparative Study on Access to Energy, Austrian and South African Perspectives. It is planned that by interpreting various legislative policies, programs, and plans, and thus identifying similarities and differences to determine legislative overlaps and gaps, my thesis will be successful in recommending legislative developments and policy design that fosters exchange that is mutually beneficial and conducive for energy sector progress. And I thank you for your consideration and for taking the time to listen to my presentation. Okay, now I'm putting the other hat on and back to moderating <laughs> this panel session. I would now like to move on to the last presenter in our doctoral candidate presentations, and that is my colleague, Carlotta. Carlotta, you can introduce yourself to the people. Okay. Um, I'm sharing the screen, but I think you should be able to see it now, right? With uh, full perfect, screen. yeah, full screen. Great. Okay, so yeah, thank you both, Clarissa and Greta, for your presentation. I'm happy to discuss it, discuss our projects with you in a more informal setting, as said today, or intimate. Um, so I'm going to present also a that section of my thesis um, that I also shall be finishing soon. Um, so the title of today's presentation is Climate Litigation in Brazil between Structure and Agency. I will explain then what I mean by these two words. And it contextualizes within my Broader thesis project is about climate change litigation against states, uh, bringing forward the legal conversation on the state's duty to mitigate climate change. I'm a PhD, PhD candidate as Larissa at the University of Graz, um, Public Law Department, and I'm also affiliated to the Research Center Clean Law Graz that is hosting this workshop today. So, um, just to give you a short overview of what we are my thesis. Uh, so this is a, in my thesis I'm comparing climate change litigation in Europe with South America, particularly with four countries in South America, Brazil, Colombia, Mexico, and Argentina. I'm looking at the enabling factors of climate change litigation in these countries. So what are the reasons why litigation emerges and possibly succeeds in different jurisdictions? And then looking at how litigators are using disruptive legal strategies to succeed in these cases, and then at what are the impacts of these cases, particularly policy and legal innovation, um, and the impacts on the movement, so the litigators that are that are resorting to, to legal mobilizations, and finally on the legal community. Quite a broad term. So um, when we try to understand um, or when we try to explain uh, legal mobilization, 
it is useful to to have a theoretical framework an analytical framework to um, refer to and indeed is a question that has occupied already social legal scholars who have come up with different theories to explain these and we can summarize at least or we can identify at least two macro theories to explain why people turn to courts to resolve political disputes uh, one has to do with structure and the other has to do with agency so when we talk about structure we talk about um, permanent or quasi-permanent factors regarding um, social support systems, uh, legal opportunities, and political opportunities. So when talking about social support structures, we think of um, having experienced lawyers in one jurisdiction that are able to turn to court, um, a network of NGOs, uh, think tank, or, or funding organizations that are providing resources. When we talk about legal opportunities, we think about or we talk about accessible procedures, established rights. In this case, it would be important to have recognized right to an healthy environment in the Constitution, strong remedies, um, a, a judiciary that has previously decided in a positive sense towards uh, with regard to the environment. When it comes to the political opportunities, actually, we have to think that normally um, um, litigants will be more likely to turn to court when a political system is less responsive to them. So maybe when there are less structures where they can, um, where, when they can uh, express their, their environmental concerns or their social concerns more generally. However, this is not enough to explain why people resort to litigation. So we also have to think of the other macro factor that is agency. So a specific set of people motivation to use the court. Um, this seems quite banal, but the literature for quite some time has overseen this aspect. So we have to think of a litigants and civil society motivation to turn to courts, funders motivation to provide money, resources, and judge, judges' willingness to promote these kind of cases. Um, why it is important to, to look at the so-called support structure. So now I'm just, uh, I will just focus on the social support structure. So again, the, the litigators, uh, the experienced lawyers, the NGOs, the funders, um, in particular on the litigators. So. I think that there are three reasons why it is particularly important to understand uh, who is litigating. The first one is that, um, that the identity of the litigator also changes what litigation is and how it is used. Um, so it helps, uh, it helps us understanding litigation on an epistemic level. The um, other reason is rather normative. So by understanding who is litigating we also understand whether litigation is accessible to the most affected communities uh, secondly knowing who is litigating makes us understand uh, why uh, certain actors are more likely to succeed in court why certain act actors actually do turn to court why others not and finally it helps us understand the impacts generally or broadly understood of climate change litigation this is because just by knowing what are the goals of the movements or of the litigator, we can understand whether the litigation endeavor was indeed successful. Um, so coming to Brazil now, um, I have analyzed the, the structure in, in Brazil, the social, the political and the legal support structure in Brazil. And not only me, but also others in the literature have uh, concluded that Brazil is a fertile soil for climate change litigation. And it's because we, had already they had already a quite high level of civil society engagement with environmental issues already from the 80s uh, even more in the 90s in brazil and this has continued there was already public prosecutors activism in court uh, there is so-called procedural abundance so there are different kinds of actions to which a brazilian litigator could resort to to challenge climate change policies there is, there is a solid environmental law framework so in the constitution there is a recognition of the right to an healthy environment at the same time we have a solid environmental and climate change legislation and finally um, we have quite strong and flexible judicial remedies this might be a little complicated to explain now so in case i can go deeper in that in the q a and then when we when it comes to the actors agency we also saw during the last years 
that in this, um, the Brazilian, the number of Brazilian cases has risen to a considerable extent from less than 10 before 2019 to more than 50 in 2023. And this has happened because some people wanted to do so. Um, so we've seen particularly a, a coalition, unprecedented coalition between political parties and civil society organizations to file in a coordinated way a number of climate change cases before the Supreme Court. The climate movement has really expanded to different actors, including academics, research center, physical environmental science departments and funding organization from Brazil. And lastly, the Supreme Court has turned into a, an ally of the climate change movement. And this is also something that in the, we wouldn't have taken for granted uh, before because the Supreme Court did not used to be exactly um, a green court. So in the last uh, few slides, I will try to show you some findings from, from my research and from my interviews, particularly with uh, climate litigators in Brazil, um, regarding how the support structure, so this, this climate litigation movement has emerged and developed. Um, so we've seen that political resistance was both a motivating factor for the birth of climate change litigation in Brazil or the rise of climate change litigation in Brazil and a unifying factor. I will explain what I mean by that, but also that the climate litigation movement cannot be reduced to one thing, but there are different kinds of structures, different kinds of actors, big versus small players, and different kinds of models in which they act. I will show you, I will show you this by talking about two different set of cases. Uh, the first is the Pacochi Vergi, which means green package case cases. Um, so this is a set of seven uh, direct constitutional actions which were filed before the Supreme Court in Brazil, seeking for the restoration of environmental and climate change policies, which were dismantled under Bolsonaro's government. Um, here, the, the interviews uh, that I've conducted showed me that Bolsonaro, uh, the previous government, and its strong the regulatory action was a big factor for the rise of climate change, the most important factor for the rise of climate change education in Brazil. Um, the litigators felt like that was the only that the only space that they could use was the judicial space, as the political space was completely locked to them, was completely lost to them under Bolsonaro's government. And also, quite interestingly, uh, Bolsonaro had a unifying effect. So actors, environmental organizations that had not acted in a joint way, had competed before for funds, came together, uh, minimized their protagonism to. Um, create this action, to pursue this action together. And this is something that come up. I, I just um, show you here an extract from an interview where the lawyer was telling me that, yes, there was already a network of relationship before, people already met in various places, but with the effect of Bolsonarism, and particularly during actually the impeachment action against Bolsonaro, these different forces, these different organizations joined forces to act in a more synergistic thematic block. So people would produce the material and just give it out without asking to be the authors of the case or the amigos of the case. They would just share it with the others. Uh, the package, another interesting finding about the Paco Civergi case is, is that this reflects a model of litigation that we call strategic litigation model, that is rather a top-down model where the lawyer is the central um, creator of the lawsuit and the litigation or the law is used as the direct tool to obtain political and social change. Um, Another set of cases that is interesting to, to look into are um, three cases that were filed against big mining projects in Rio Grande do Sul, uh, that is a state located in the southern part of Brazil and that has the highest amount of coal reserves in the country. So there is a big interest there from the mining industry to extract and use this coal. At the same time, there is one of the most antique old uh, environmental movements in this in this very state so um there were three climate actions uh that were filed um to stop big mining projects in uh, in this part of brazil 
and to partly to include climate impacts in environmental uh, impact assessment. Um, here, the actor was not a set of big organization and political parties, as in the previous case, but rather a local committee, the committee to combat big mining industry in Rio Grande do Sul. The interesting fact about this committee is that it, it really is a composite movement, including lawyers, trade union scientists, farmers association, indigenous and quilombolas. This committee does not only do litigation, uh, they do they do agroecological education, they do they they are involved in, in other kind of, of political movements and, and battles, but they also have a a, a juridical and legal section where they also organize litigation cases, uh, political political cases. Uh, another important fact about these um, about these cases is that they were um, they were also created uh, thanks to the alliances with with other actors. So here we see in a small case in a small scale what happened also with bigger cases. So the committee was allied with scientists from the University of Rio Grande do Sul, but also with the Public Prosecutors Association and with um, national uh, funding organizations. Uh, and finally, the last finding is that this kind of structure reflects rather a cause lawyering model. So this is rather a bottom up kind of uh, action where a movement that is engaged in different kind of political action is also using litigation to the extent that this the latter one reflects the needs and demands of the affected and vulnerable community, which in this case were mostly indigenous communities and uh, and farmers. Um, so to come with to come to some conclusion, um, I would say that climate litigation in Brazil. Um, shows us that there is a mixture between two different kinds of models, a strategic litigation model that we have seen dominant in the global north together with a rather bottom-up kind of movement, of litigation movement, depending on the type of problem that the litigation wants to address. Also, um, agency and structure were joint enabling factor, factors of climate change litigation. Um, Brazil, both small cases um, and federal cases, also show us an example of cooperation among very different civil society organizations, but also academia, funding parties, political parties, and public prosecutors. And also, not only in the bottom-up cases, but also um, when big players are involved in litigation, we see a growing accessibility of litigation to vulnerable communities, also with funding from national organization, publication of legal material, and dissemination, dissemination workshop. So uh, that's it from my side. I didn't share my email in the slide, but I can post it in the chat. And I thank you for the attention and we can open the floor for discussion. Thanks so much, Carlotta. And, and thanks to Greta as well for your um, contributions. And it's really great to see all of us at these stages um, in our research and, and to be able to share our research on this platform. So I'll hand over to Greta first because um, you were the first presenter. So um, if anybody has any questions or comments for Greta or Greta, if you would like to ask anything or say anything, then the floor is yours. Uh, thank you for having me today, <laughs> first of all. And um, I just want to say that I will have to sign off soon. So please do not hesitate, uh, ask me a question today, or we can connect via LinkedIn, or um, please write me an email, we can discuss uh, regarding climate change and waste management sectors, so I would be grateful. Perfect, thanks so much, Greta. Um, if you'll allow me, then I can post your email in the chat if anybody wants to contact you. Okay, perfect. Then. Great. Great, I'll do that. Um, yeah, so... Uh, we're basically here for some open discussion. Um, if you would have any questions for um, either Greta, myself, or Colotta, Colotta, over to you. I will start with a question to Greta, but she has to leave soon. Um, so uh, I already listened to your presentation, but this time I 
I got even more curious about an aspects you touch upon or actually about um, the solution to the problem that you are identifying so clearly, right? The, about the, how we consider uh, waste, waste management, what we consider to be waste management. So uh, my question here would be, what is the state of the art when it comes to uh, legislative processes at the European Union level? Uh, if you see that there is a door opening there to, to solve this problem, if there are negotiations happening already, and also, given that you're talking about the European Union level, but also about state level, um, whether you already have an idea of what could be good practices and in which states we can find these good practices. So what state could be interesting to, to compare in this sense? Um, so probably I will start by saying that uh, um, I do do not see any proposals for amendments at the moment um and i mean uh, it it could be hard to let's say um propose such amendments because uh, ipcc guidelines um is for uh, calculating and and reporting it's like a methodology for um, calculation of uh, greenhouse gas emissions and um, under these guidelines waste sector is understood uh, more narrow than under waste framework directive uh, but waste framework directive has uh, let's say different uh, targets first of all and those uh, two different uh, documents have different um, targets that is my opinion um and i mean uh, to 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 have those uh, two different documents and to to make the scopes uh, um, that they match uh, probably it it is not a uh, um, possible decision um because as I said, uh, those documents have different uh, different targets. Um, so my um, my idea that our solution could be public participation and giving information to the public that we understand waste management sector differently, and we're when we're talking about let's say waste management management sector emits only four percent, let's say four percent in Lithuania, one half one and a half percent in Austria, so. Um, uh, we need to we need to say uh, another sentence that some of the emissions are in in different sectors as well. So my my idea uh, regarding the solution of it um, at the moment, uh, maybe I'll find some other solutions. But at the moment, uh, um, focus on public participation and giving information to 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 society. I hope uh, I answered your question. Perfect. Thanks so much, Carlotta, for the question and, and Greta for your response. There's a raised hand from um, a Mac that we can't really see anything else. Just um... Wh whoever is using the device titled Mac. Yes, this is Kola Wale. Hi, welcome uh, back. I'm sorry, I, I didn't know. I'll just put my name there right away. No problem at all. Yes, uh, great. Uh, thank you for your presentation. I really enjoyed it. So I was wondering um, in the course of your presentation whether you have an idea or you want to uh, you you want to engage in conversation on what existing instruments um can be used for the operationalizations of um, um waste management uh, for instance i don't know whether your discussion fits in into um PIA regime, 
uh, for instance, um, I, I was doing a bit of research on life cycle assessment. So if we look at life cycle assessment that deal with products, and um, that process is uh, really fully considered, uh, whether that can be a way of integrating um, reduction of waste or management of weight into the existing regime of EIA, which is expanding anyway. So I don't know whether I'm making sense because I've heard perhaps since um, the problem of waste that you've indicated is like the least of all the contributions to uh, the global emission. And we already have a working tool in the form of a HIA system. So I don't know whether uh, that form parts of your analysis or something you think of looking at. I'm really sorry. I'm not sure I understood your question, but uh, did you ask uh, about like the least uh, green gas house emissions? Or could you could you please uh, repeat your question? It's okay. Uh, what, what I'm saying is this: that you, in, in your analysis of um, reducing emission through uh, through um, addressing the issue of waste management, and you specifically uh, speak to waste framework directive for the EU. I'm asking whether there is any intersection between that framework and the HIA directive. So yes, when when we're talking about waste sector and reduction of uh, greenhouse gas emissions from waste sector, as it is understood under IPCC guidelines, of course we need to focus on. Um, waste framework uh, directive and uh, let's say waste hierarchy and waste hierarchy first of all um, goes from waste prevention uh, reuse recycle then other recovery and uh, the, the the last uh, disposal so of course if uh, we will uh, this mm, let's say will um, will treat waste in in landfills less so we will uh, emit less uh, green gas house emissions as it is understood under ipcc guidelines um but but you know as uh, ipcc guidelines scope of waste sector does not e equally match waste framework directive um i i focused in in my research uh, on on, on the fact that there are some emissions in other sectors from waste management sector as it is understood under waste framework directive as well. Not only, let's say, 4% of uh, emissions, but uh, we have, in fact, more emissions from waste management sector. I'm not sure, uh, did I understand uh, uh, your question and did I um, answer to your question? I, I hope it was in that way. Uh, the, what, what I'm asking actually is whether there is any interaction between the Waste Framework Directive and the existing regime of environmental impact assessment. I understand that the impact assessment regime is growing day by day to accommodate different kinds of activities, which to me will include waste management. And mm -hmm. uh, one of the type of the impact assessment regime is the life cycle assessment, which looks at the life cycle of a product from the production to, from cradle, uh, from, from the beginning to the end. Mm -hmm. And whether it fits into that, whether you can have conversation in case the framework um, is such that it's a bit problematic, uh, whether we can integrate it into the existing 
impact assessment regime? That's my question. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I want to say that I did not focus on life cycle assessments, so I cannot tell you, uh, I don't know more ab about it, but I know, uh, I understand what are you saying to me, that life cycle assessment, of course, it's important when we're talking about green gas house emissions, especially from waste management sector. So um, it's it's um, important nuance, um, and probably I, I could uh, do more research in, in this. Um, because, of course, when we're talking about recycling and green gas house emissions from waste management sector, so uh, and let's say when when we uh get uh, secondary raw materials so uh we can use secondary raw materials instead of primary raw materials so we we can um let's say uh, not emit uh, some emissions uh, from primary materials but just use secondary raw materials so uh, life cycle assessment is important here. I understand that, but I did not uh, mm, research uh, from from this pers perspective here. I just compared um, the scope uh, under different uh, documents. But thank you very much. Thank you very much. for your question and, and thank you Greta for your response. Um, Jose, I see your hand. Do you want to um, ask your question? Yeah. First of all, thank you for organizing this panel. It was, I found it really interesting and uh, it was such a pity that I just noticed that the conference was going to take place just today and uh, I couldn't join before uh, sadly but I would be here, here tomorrow and uh, then my question would be uh, addressed to you, Larissa, and uh, taking into consideration your, your research, I would like to know if you have um, deal with an, a, like a human, some kind of human trait approach with the topic that you are dealing with, because there is a broad discussion whether to, to, to understand the right to any as a human right or not, in which moment are we, and this broad decision and taking into consideration your really check at um, you, I think that you can probably have some really important remarks that you can let us know. So thank you for your attention. Thank you so much for your question. Um, yeah, that was actually one of the elements that I've discussed in the conclusions and recommendation section in my thesis. Um, obviously, when discussing the rights to energy access, it is, is, it is a predominantly um, global South-centered discussion. Um, we've seen examples for, uh, in Mexico where there's been lit litigation on the rights to energy access. Similarly, in South Africa, we've had some case law on the rights to energy access, but these cases have all been um, dismissed in the respective courts because there isn't obviously an understanding of what the rights to energy access entails. Um, there's now recent developments in academia on the rights to clean, green, fair, um, and you know equitable access. But again, we don't really know what that means. Um, and understanding the rights to energy access as a universal concept is something that I was focusing on in my thesis. Um, obviously, the, the problem that I had there was the different understandings of the rights to energy access within the different contexts of regions, but also a national basis and compete and comparing different litigious environments. So what I aimed to do in my recommendations focusing specifically on the human rights-based approach is to acknowledge that regardless of whether uh, there, there was, um, I, I had a question from another academic asking me if it really is necessary to have a universal right to energy access. And that was the perspective that I came from because um, in my thesis, I basically summarized to say that regardless if a country has energy access, and in terms of the global north, where they do have electricity access when you turn the light on, um, or whether you're dealing with a really remote part of a global south country, you having a standard for energy access is important for ensuring universal energy access. So defining a right to energy access places a responsibility on every state to ensure that regardless of what level of energy access they have, that that energy access is universally accepted and universally kept secure for its citizens. So 
that was the argument on my human rights based approach to state that a universal rights to energy access would be beneficial not only for the global south but also for the global north in ensuring that the energy access that is attained currently is still kept up to standard because i found that that's sometimes the discussion within the human rights narrative is that um, there might be energy access but whether this access is sufficient to meet basic needs for short term and long term is not really addressed so there's also instances and there were case studies and in some cases where communities had electricity access, but then they were cut off of the grid for maybe a month or two, and then they received energy access again. And states had explicitly stated there was energy access and we have attained our goals. And as such, if you had a universal right to energy access that you know implied security of supply, then we wouldn't you know, have uh, any question or doubt about whether sust or unsustained electricity access still means energy access. So yeah, that's that's a really good question and, and thank you so much. So yeah, um, I'm actually completing um, a paper on the rights to energy access as we speak. So when I have that published, then I will be sure to share it with you and, and hopefully get some comments from you as well. Thank you. Um, if there are any questions or any additional comments from any of the attendees, um, please feel free to uh, raise your hand and, and switch on your camera and engage with us. Carlotta, over to you. Yes, Larissa, uh, oh, Larissa, uh, Larissa yes. yes. Well, thank you for that beautiful presentation on right to energy access. Yes, I, I just want to engage you on a couple of uh, things with respect to this energy access uh, conversation. The first number one is, uh, I think you've tried to explain it, but I want a bit of more clarity whether we can have global definition for this right to energy access. That's number one question. The second one is, how do we um, marry um, our conversation on reducing greenhouse gas emission, particularly with respect to global south that are still dependent on uh, fossil fuel production. For instance, most of the oil producing, I mean, energy producing uh, countries in Africa, they rely essentially on fossil fuel, Angola, Nigeria, and they are opening up new field now, they're already contending with the issue of inadequate access to energy, inadequate productions. And uh, it, it, it serves so many purposes for them, not just as the mainstream of the economy, but also for uh, access. Now, I, I don't know whether that conversation will still be in the context in which we are having it in the global north when their own is about green energy, uh, just transition, or whatever. So I want your thoughts on that, please. Uh, thank you so much for those um, questions. So firstly, regarding the global definition of a right to energy access, um, I do not foresee there being a global definition, simply because I don't think we can get universal consensus on what a right to energy access should entail. Um, and that comes down to the, the extent of my research and the fact that you have a number of global North countries that have already achieved energy access and it's basic understanding and basic definition. Um, and so a lot of global North countries, for example, France released a statement um, a few years prior stating that there was no need for them to clearly define the premises of energy access because every citizen had electricity. So now when we have those kind of starting points, then we can already acknowledge that there's going to be um, a misunderstanding from country to country and situation to situation as to what energy access means. This can be both a benefit, um, a blessing and a curse, so to say. Um, a curse in the sense that Without a global definition, as I previously stated, you do have the possibility that there's no universally accepted standard of adequate energy access. But this is also a blessing because there's a lot of flexibility with energy access considerations. Now, 
this then filters into the next part of your question. If we had a universal um, definition for energy access that, for example, limited energy access to green and clean energy, I think a lot of countries in the global south would be at uh, a loss simply because we know, especially in global south, lived realities that renewable energy of any kind is way more expensive than has, is originally envisioned. Um, additionally, if we look at land mass alone, um, the global south has a lot more land mass to cover than the global north, respectively, which means that the problems of electricity sharing and energy sharing that is experienced in Europe is not the same within the continent of Africa, as an example. Right. So with that being said, there are a number of um, academics who have, for example, put forward the debate of utilizing nuclear energy uh, in the debate in the global south as a means to, at first points, ensure universal electricity access. And once we've ensured universal electricity access to then take the next step in transferring and and uh, transitioning that electricity into renewable sources. So that's the one debate, the use of, of nuclear. The second is when you have things, for example, like the Just Transition Agreement, which pledges over 80 million um, in funds uh, into South Africa, I think that does create a bit of a, a cushion, a great, a great cushion for developing renewable energy in a country. And if such just transition agreements do carry through with their promises, then we do have the funds to ensure that electricity access is clean, green, renewable, sustainable, security is met, electricity is met, and we are meeting our um, reduction of greenhouse gas emissions and the targets, the climate targets that have been set. But the problem here is with these just transition agreements and with the funds that are being put into the country, these are all political declarations to date, which means that there are no firm commitments made by, you know, maybe countries that have the resources to provide funding to global South countries to develop their energy sector, which means that global South countries now have to rely independently on themselves or one another for the development of their energy sectors. Within Africa, we see a possible development of this with the AFCFTA. Um, we are hoping with the development of the Africa Free Continental Free Trade Agreement and the Free Trade Area that we can see um, transfer of services, specifically energy services, from one country to the next. But I think a lot of a lot more global South countries are in agreement that the first debate that I had mentioned about ensuring electricity access is the most pertinent debate. Because we can't claim to want to ensure electricity access, but only limit that electricity access to green energy or renewable energy. Because I think majority, and especially if we have energy access goals for 2030, I don't think with current um, you know, resources and current skills in the fields of renewable energy, we don't have the necessary anything to put it bluntly. We don't have what is needed to make sure that that transition in the next seven years is renewable. So the question then becomes, at the risk of putting aside our climate commitments, which is never ever the, you know, you, we never want that to be the case. Um, and we would prefer to have a solution that ensures that greenhouse gas emissions are met, but you also need to consider what common but differentiated responsibilities and capabilities. That also becomes another consideration in the debate. So you have developing countries who have had little to no impact to the greater emission scheme. Um, and you can't expect those countries to now, you know, revert back to a system that is already inherently against them. So I think where I stand uh, and, and my opinion based on the research that I've completed is I think energy access needs to be the first point of call. Um, the UN Secretary um, Antonio Gutierrez has released a statement um, further supporting that the need to ensure SDG 7 automatically has benefits for the other SDGs. Now we're talking education, healthcare, 
you know, I mean, our water systems within our cities are operating on electricity. Our the, the very technology that we need to progress is functioning on electricity. And, and once we achieve those goals, then maybe we might have the solution to ensure that in the achievement of those goals, those greenhouse gas emissions reductions are being met. Let's also, in that caveat, put into the discussion the common but differentiated responsibilities and capabilities. Maybe the Global North does have a responsibility to ensure that while the Global South is ensuring electricity access, that that green transition does take place. And there are a number of agreements, even prior to these just transition agreements, even prior to COP26 dis discussions, that go back to initial uh, discussions between the EU and the AU. They have their own um, agreements, political agreements, that also indicate support, consideration, and resource and skill sharing. So, yeah, I think on their own, a lot of global South countries would not be able to do that because let's be very honest, um, the main consideration is sometimes even poverty, hunger, gender equality, um, education. And those considerations can't be forgotten in the context of lived experiences of the citizens there, just for the efforts of ensuring globally that we have lowered emissions reductions, especially when countries that are being mostly impacted have the least emissions to contribute. So yeah, that's that's my comment. <laughs> Carlotta, over to you. Brilliant, thank you. Yeah, uh, yeah. Thank you so much, Larissa. This is very interesting. Um, and yeah, I think it's contributing a lot to my understanding of of energy access and and what it means. Indeed, and I think it's very interesting that you're picking different cases to really show that there cannot be a, a universal definition. Um, and it's very, it's a very, very, very complex topic. So congratulations on. <laughs> coming to a conclusion, a solid conclusion in this phase of your thesis. Uh, well, something I was I was wondering, since you were also mentioning now the common but differentiated responsibilities principle, no? In the definition of the what energy access would have been in Europe, have you considered also including fair? So besides affordable, reliable, uh, reliable and renewable, also for it to be fair towards other countries. So it would not be enough if we manage to have affordable energy for Europeans. If for, do, for doing that, we have, for example, to go and excavate new wells in Libya or, or in Nigeria. And also if by doing that, we are not only compromising our, our commitments, but also the energy security in these countries. So I, I was wondering whether this is something you consider, maybe if it's included in the notion of renewable, that would be interesting for me. And also in the definition of energy access for a Global South, you said basic was the only requirement, right? Uh, and that I, so it would be enough to, for everybody to have basic access to energy and the other concerns are, are secondary. Here, my, my thought was, what if energy access compromises other basic rights, such as uh, the right to water, no? which is a problem when it comes to coal mines, for example. So if you're including this, this concern um, in the definition. And yeah, so I, I, was, I was thinking about you know, it's amazing that Europe and the African Union or South Africa are coming to this just transition agreement. But my, my question here is, is Europe also going against its, its economic interest in uh, going for this agreement? I mean, it would be interesting if the European Union is limiting its own uh, access to energy sources. Then in Africa, that would seem like a fair just transition agreement also to me. Um, yeah, so if, if you see that there could be some interesting improvement in this relationship between European European Union and, and Africa. So now with the war scenario, everything is, is more complicated. But anyway, I, I will leave it to that. 
Um, thank you so much for those, those questions. Yeah, three of those questions are three considerations that I have tackled with quite extensively in my thesis and wondering whether I should mention them or not because each of those questions warrant their own research altogether. But I will try and do justice to each of those as best I can. Um, with regards to fair energy access, this was actually a consideration that I brought because I was looking, um, when I had first started researching, I started my research in 2021, and this was before the war in Ukraine and before we had to deal with, I mean, January of 2021 is when I started. Um, and so when I thought of my research question, there really was no energy access concerns across Europe and natural gas or electricity. So um, the, the, it seemed fairly clear to me to have two um, examples that were contrasting in the sense of its understanding of energy access. And so the consideration of fairness, um, when looking at the definition and the way fairness is understood in terms of energy access, uh, it's a little bit tricky because when everybody applies the energy access definition, it's implied internally. So within the country context, for example, when we talk about fair energy access, it's that every citizen in the state has uh, equal opportunity to energy access, right? So it's not looked at within the context of external extraction or um, you know, coal mining in another country, or, or uh, I was even interested in, in um, uh, the implications of, for example, in certain parts of Africa, there's hydroelectric plants, um, and some of those hydro dams have prevented um, biodiversity in rivers that flow across a number of different countries. So uh, if I talk about, for example, the Akavango Delta, they're in, it's located predominantly in Botswana, but a number of neighboring countries to Botswana, and there was a dam project that was facilitated further up um, the Akavango Delta that was supposed to be utilized maybe at some point for hydroelectric energy, but um, the development of that power plant or, or of that dam specifically had negative impacts for biodiversity further down the line. But when considering whether the building of such a dam was fair to neighboring countries, this was not put under consideration because definitions there since there is no universally accepted definition in uh, one un agreement or the other or some sort of a resolution or the other there is nothing to hold other countries accountable for their energy um, relations to one another ultimately those um, relations to one another are governed by bilateral agreements um, and you also have to consider within the european perspective it is very complex in the African perspective, it's a little bit different because we have national energy providers. So for example, within South Africa, our electricity provider is ESCOM, which is a national or a state company. And so we have one electricity provider. So we can, for example, hold that one electricity provider accountable if they have mined in another country and caused damages to that other country's ecosystems or increased the number of emissions in that other country's partnered um, yeah, and the, the greenhouse gas emissions of that country and, and damaged their um, position in terms of climate change. But within Europe, because you have so many different electricity providers, you have to understand that maybe the coal mined in one country is shared responsibility of a number of different named and unknown electricity suppliers. Um, and the trading of electricity supply between electricity producers within Europe itself um, is often not discussed, but it does happen. So if one electricity supplier, for example, has more has produced more electricity than another and the other is running short, then they can sell internally amongst each other to provide for their, their uh, consumers. So that's also something that does happen. Um, and because of the complexities of that web, the chain of responsibility is thus not identified. So now we have firstly that fair is not considered externally or outside of your territory. And secondly, who do we hold responsible in terms of electricity suppliers because there's just so many. Um, there's that gray area that really would not allow you to really ensure that your energy access and energy supply in one country is also considerate 
of your neighbors or considerate to the countries that are supplying you with the natural resources to make this happen. Secondly, um, in terms of ensuring their right to energy access and its implications on other rights, such as um, the right to water, I haven't looked at that. Um, I haven't done research in that altogether because I think that, like I said, if we want to look at certain forms of energy access, they then open um, a whole different can of worms into other possibilities. And um, the reason why I mentioned the dam example is because that specifically correlates with the example that you gave of the right to energy versus the right to water. Um, but then that also discusses the right to bi biodiversity rights. Then that also looks at um, land rights and property rights that also goes into a number of different um, other options. It was the same with wind turbines um, and the utilization of wind turbines for agricultural or, or ag on agricultural land um, and the implications of that. And so that is something that I would actually be really interested in writing a paper on because I think that um, I think there is compromising one right to ensure the achievement of another right is a discussion that is always pertinent, especially in the human rights normative framework. So figuring out where that line is and, and where you are safe to cross and where you're not safe to cross is something that I would be very interested in. So um, yeah, I can't say that I have too much expertise in that um, just yet, but if you wanna write a paper, <laughs> I'm available. <laughs> um, and, and your last question. Um, the reason why the EU has been so willing to enter into a relationship with South Africa is because South Africa is a long standing partner to the EU um, in Africa. Now, uh, this is more political than it is uh, legal, but um, the EU uh, has a history of involvement um, in South Africa and has been a funder in a number of projects in South Africa for a number of years. And so that relationship is already well established. Um, we do have a lot of environmental agencies that also still operate within South Africa. Um, but there's also other agreements that happen between EU member states and other countries. For example, the green hydrogen project that is now taking place in Namibia is um, funded with the support of the German Environment Agency. So you do see um, distinct partnerships that are taking place. But I will say to speak um, politically, I think the reason why a lot of other African countries have not necessarily entered into such vocal agreements is because I think at this point, um, and this is from personal opinion and, and not based on, on any other, um, and, and not in my, in my professional capacity, but um, in my personal opinion, I think that the political narrative across the African continent is to look internally at what we can determine and what we can reach from each other. So especially with the development of the AFCFTA, a lot of um, African countries are looking to each other to find a solution out of their energy access concerns. Um, I think the, the Just Transition Agreement, and like I said, it's a political declaration at this point, was supposed to be an olive branch. Um, I do think that that agreement was more symbolic than it was uh, practical at this stage, but let's hope that it does become a practical reality. But I think it was uh, developed as a means to extend an olive branch to an African country that the EU has had partnerships with in a number of different instances as a kind of model for what could happen with other African countries. So I don't think it was limiting in that sense. I mean, if you read the Just Transition Agreement, it does also um, contain a, a paragraph on fostering African partnerships. So I think that this is maybe just an example of the first of many, we don't know. Um, again, we don't know if it's going to happen because at COP26, everybody was all on board for it and the whole declaration was written. And then afterwards when uh, people were discussing the importance of the money side of it, everything went quiet. So let's see what happens there um, on the ground. But yeah, thanks for the questions. I, I hope I, I answered them as best I could. Yes, you did. Thank you. Um, if there are any other questions or comments, um, Colata, I actually wanted to ask you with your research. Um, so you have 
included quite a broad scope of countries within your thesis um, from the Global South and the Global North. What set of criteria are you using to kind of determine what is relevant for your thesis and what isn't relevant? Um, how are you determining um, maybe which legislation, which litigation, um, which climate cases you will include versus which the ones that you won't? Yeah, so I I started by analyzing Europe um, because I started my I started my thesis in two thousand and nineteen, and it seems the most obvious thing for me to do to to focus on Europe because of the Organda case and the way it was it was leading to, um, and also because I'm from Italy and therefore I'm more familiar with European jurisdiction. Um, it was also easy to limit the to limit to a specific type of cases because because back then that was the main type of cases and it is still rather simpler to do so for for European countries because there is a dominant type of case there that is the Uganda kind of case so uh, that has helped me to narrow down at least to rights based uh, systemic climate litigation so cases that are based on human rights and that are seeking for a change of the uh, general mitigation policy. Now the challenge was uh, to reduce the scope when looking at global South countries because climate litigation is something broader uh, there in South America. So we have more peripheral cases. And at the beginning, it was mostly uh, peripheral cases. So cases where climate change um, is just a peripheral and marginal part of the, of the legal argumentation. Um, so I, what I did in that case was to limit myself to not only central cases, also peripheral cases, but systemic ones. So structural cases that are seeking for a change in a law or in a general inaction. And that's why I've also limited myself to, to this jurisdiction. Actually, Argentina does not have a systemic case. So I'm also, I'm looking at Argentina just as, a, as an example just when it comes to the to the support structure, because I find it interesting to compare the climate litigation movement as it is in Latin America to the climate litigation movement in Europe. And I think that Argentina is more of this kind of bottom up cases or Argentina or South America in general. And Argentina is still one of the biggest emitters in South America. So that's also was, was the reason of narrowing down to these four countries. They are the four countries in Latin America that emit the most. Uh, so let's say for a fairness issue, and they are the, the countries, except for Argentina, that have structural systemic climate change education. So that allowed me to compare with uh, with European countries. Okay, but I have and, a large set of countries with Europe. So yeah, um, and then um, I was really interested in your research regarding the differences between the climate movements from the Latin American perspective and the European perspective. I think often they're not, we hear about the lessons that uh, can go from the European perspective to the Latin American perspective, but within your research, um, have you developed maybe a set of uh, criteria or key takeaways that um, the European perspective could learn from the Latin American cases? I mean, like you said, there's a lot more litigation happening in countries like Brazil um, and yesterday's uh, presentation or was it yesterday or the day before um where we had a discussion on um climate litigation in brazil yeah it was yesterday um by anna carolina when she mentioned environmental liability law and maybe the possibilities that brazil is in fact a fertile ground for climate litigation so um do you think that this is the case and and are these scenarios indicate um, lessons that maybe the european countries could learn from Latin America. Yeah, so I think that's the case. Um, I can refer particularly to the case of Brazil because it's the one on which I have more case studies because there are more cases in Brazil and because I have completed almost my interviews at least with the, with the Brazilian litigators. So I think the most interesting thing about uh, the litigation movement in Brazil is its level of coordination that I was talking about before. So um, 
first of all, the coordination between different organizations. That is something that we didn't see, for example, in Germany. I don't know if you remember the Neubauer case, for example. The Neubauer case, we know it as a Fridays for Future case, but it's just because um, this was the last case that was put together together with other cases, with other complaints that were originally filed, no? And this organization did not collaborate, actually. They had different different complaints, no? But all good, because in the moment in which the climate law was passed, all these climate actions went directly before the Supreme Court. But um, it, it can be easier and quick, quicker when you have a coalition of organizations. At the same time, it gives the judges also the idea that this is really coming as a as a massive movement that is not just the forefront organization Greenpeace asking the case, but this is really coming from a different set of organizations. So the the seven hundred sixty constitutional case that I'm, no, I didn't mention it today. I mentioned it in a previous presentation that was brought by four political parties because they were the one because associations are not directly legitimated to go to court but um at the at the bottom or the one that were taking the initiative was the coalition of 10 different civil society organizations so we had children organizations human rights indigenous organizations and so on and so forth and that really created the idea that deforestation is a uh, a structural massive problem affecting all Brazilian society. So it gave this sense of, of the, the legitimacy also to the case. That's not the only, that's not, not the only advantage. There is obviously also a technical advantage, no? because sometimes a small organization is not able alone to provide the scientific argumentation, the legal argumentation. So this was really important. Uh, you, have, you have research centers in Brazil, like there is, we, we heard that Daniele talked two days ago. She's from a research center that is actively providing legal arguments for strategic litigation. So that means that there will not only be the experienced strategic litiga litigator in the future doing this kind of case, but also the Quilombola community, also the, the indigenous community that probably manages to capture less international funds, but still they have the legal arguments there, you know, and these legal arguments have been validated by the Supreme Court. So I, th I think this is really an example of democratizing also the, the climate litigation movement. And we did not really have this in, in Europe. Uh, we see that in Europe, the smaller organizations still struggle more to, to file cases. Uh, on the other hand, the big organizations are the ones that are able to, to capture uh, funds. And this is also unfair because normally these big organizations are just filing cases in the most secure jurisdictions and jurisdictions where they are more able to win. Uh, but I think that that's also taken away at possibility for a small organization to, to use the avenue, you know, of, of climate litigation even to, as a test case, even just to open up, for example, uh, standing requirements or to, to, to create public awareness and so on and so forth. So in that sense, I think we could really learn from Brazil. Uh, just a small parenthesis, at the same time, this happened in Brazil in that specific moment because there was a very clear common enemy, you know? It was very easy for people with different ideas, ideologies, and so on, come together for a common objective. Now that, uh, that there is Lula, uh, these organizations are starting already separating, dividing, da, da, da. But uh, what, what remains, I think, it's still the, the alliance between organizations, academia, public prosecutors, like there is, I think, still, from what I understood, a fluid sharing of information. And uh, they, they have common networks where even if they are different, they are still meeting up and discussing. So yeah, I think that that's a lesson we could take, definitely. Thanks so much for that, Carlotta. Yeah, I think that's something that maybe is a little bit lagged behind within the European context. Do you think that this is um, something to do with maybe the, the legislative ideologies of the European you know, states in that there is a, a fairly distinct separation when it comes to the understandings of what is happening within your own country? I mean, in the Latin American context, we do see a wave of, of climate litigation coming across the whole continent in the fact of 
once it was triggered in one country, there was sort of these lessons learned and, and formulas, so to say, that were then applied within different contexts across Latin America. Whereas in the European context, um, I mean, we have Eugenda, we have Neubauer, um, we can name those ones off by heart, but I mean, there haven't been really many predominant cases that have now taken the forefront as, as what Eugenda and Neubauer have done. And we don't really see many people coming forward with those kind of cases. So do you think that um, maybe the, the conservative legal structures of Europe have kind of prevented this, maybe the, the necessary push that needs to happen in climate litigation for us to adopt the similar structures as those in Latin America? No, I don't think it's that. So I think it rather has to do, um, so um, I, I think in Europe, the difficulty has to do more with the um, legal conservatism in most of the European countries. So our law is generally more conservative. Uh, our courts are more reactive than, than progressive, whereas this is not the case in, in Latin America. So um, there is a current of thought called neoconstitutionalism, now that is inspiring part of the constitutional judges to use the law as a transformative tool. No? So, and there are more open methodologies of interpretation that Latin American judges are applying. This, of course, influences also the um legal imagination no so the way a lawyer think in europe is different from the way a lawyer think in, in latin america and they also have a more advanced like human rights uh jurisprudence so for example we saw with the climate fund case that the paris agreement was declared as a human rights treaty in brazil and that completely shocked lawyers in europe we all want to think like that, but there is no way we find the categories not to think like that. Whereas in, in Brazil, the Supreme Court years ago uh, declared that all environmental treaties are also human rights treaties. So that was a very straightforward interpretation actually from the from the Brazilian judge. So I think this is the like this is the context that creates more less hostility also against the climate litigation movement and make people more uh, make people maybe in Latin American countries more willing to join it whereas in Europe we see that lawyers that have started this movement have received a lot of hostility from even from environmental lawyers colleagues so I think that that's an interesting um distinction uh, actually i would rather say the contrary when it comes to circulation for what i just for what i've observed when it comes to climate change litigation so the european cases that i've studied are all uganda like cases and many of them actually were supported by the climate litigation network that was created by uganda no so I, I, actually because these cases were also funded on the european court of human rights they, they really were based on, on similar strategies. They really inspired each other. Also, I think Urgena was written in English or was directly translated from the court in English. So that really made it accessible. Whereas um, in Latin American country, well, now I give you the Brazilian perspective because it's the, the one that I know better. There is a linguistic barrier that I thought would be less strong between Portuguese to Brazil, but Portuguese speaking countries and Spanish speaking countries. So there is much less of an exchange of information between Brazil and other countries than I thought. So the climate litigation movement in Brazil is very auto autochthonous. Um, it's not so much influenced by, by other cases in, in Latin America as one would think. Thank you for that. I, I, it, it's a really refreshing perspective that I really didn't um, have any take on. So thank you for sharing. Um, I think that also made me rethink of how I exactly view the differences between the European and the Latin American perspectives. I think those are um, not necessarily conflicting in a certain sense, but really um, built within the dynamics of what the system allows and what the system can contain and put forward. So yeah, that's that's really interesting. Um, if there are any other questions or comments or remarks, um, any thoughts that anybody would like to share? Now is the time. Please feel free to raise your hand and um, turn on your microphone and engage with us. Um, if there is nothing else for today, then I would like to take this opportunity and thank you all for remaining with us and 
for being present and engaging with us while um, Carlotta and I shared our research with you. Um, I also extend a thank you from Greta, who unfortunately had to leave a little bit early. Um, but we are really grateful for those of you that stayed and remained with us and, and for your questions and for your comments and engagement. We really appreciate this. And uh, we hope to see you all again for tomorrow's workshop. Um, we will be finalizing our workshop tomorrow and closing off um, our proceedings. The topic for tomorrow's presentation is climate change and just transitions, legal considerations of carbon neutrality. This um, is specifically dealing with uh, just transition elements, energy law, um, and also looking more specifically at examples from um, Cuban perspectives and from um, protecting of uh, fossil fuel investments, more particularly speaking. So um, this is a really interesting panel, and uh, we have some very um, interesting presenters who are taking part, and we look forward to seeing you there. Just as a reminder, you will be able to utilize the same Zoom link that you've used today to access tomorrow's session, and we begin at 12 Central European time, and we hope to see you there. Wishing you all a great day further and a great night wherever you are. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Bye. See you tomorrow. Hey, thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.